Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. Today we'll be reviewing the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's $1.6 billion fiscal 2019 operating budget, specifically the approximately $649 million allocated for public health. We'll also address the health-related performance indicators from the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report and the department's 568 million fiscal 2019 preliminary capital budget and commitment plan for fiscal 2018 to 2022. With the Trump administration waging a multi-front assault on our nation's public health system, the work of New York City's health department has never been more important. As the White House and Congress work to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, to gut clean air and water protections, to cut funding for health research, to undermine protections in the health care system for immigrants, LGBTQ people, women, and others, and to redefine sexual health policy as being primarily about abstinence, New York City must redouble our efforts to protect the health of our communities. And we must engage in this fight without the certainty of consistent funding from the federal government, funding which comprises an inordinately large portion of the Health Department's budget. DOHMH receives federal grants, uh, federal grant funding for vital public health programs, including nearly $100 million for Ryan White HIV emergency relief, $10 million for daycare center inspections, and nearly $3 million for temporary assistance for needy families. Neither these nor any federal funding stream in the realm of, human, of health and human services should be considered safe in the Trump era. In fact, the danger of federal cu cuts is not just hypothetical, it's already happening. DOHMH receives a $1.2 million grant in the current fiscal year for its Teenage Pregnancy Prevention Program, an evidence-based, cost-effective program which helps to avert teen pregnancy and its associated health risks for teen mothers and their children. This funding has now been eliminated nationally as part of cuts to federal family planning grants. Similarly, DOHMH receives more than $5 million from the Prevention and Public Health Fund, PPHF, grants uh, which were established in the Affordable Care Act. But the continuing resolution enacted by the federal government in December completely cuts this funding nationally and locally. The city will have no choice but to step in to fill these gaps and to fund expansion of programs that address other threats from Washington. The city's Get Covered NYC initiative received a notable success this year in signing up an additional 80,000 New Yorkers for health care under our state's exchange, despite relentless rhetorical and policy attacks on the ACA by the White House and congressional leaders but there remain an estimated 350,000 New York City residents who are eligible for health care and have not yet enrolled. We need to ramp up outreach efforts to solve this problem. It's critical that we invest in connecting our city's estimated 300,000 adult undocumented immigrants to primary health care as well, building on the success of the Action Health pilot program. This will not only yield benefits and health outcomes, it will save much needed money in our struggling public hospital system. Commissioner Bassett deserves enormous credit for the department's intense focus, backed by real resources, on tackling persistent health inequities in our city. But we know that much more work remains. A 2016 analysis of five years of New York City data found that black college-educated ed mothers who gave birth in local hospitals were 12 times more likely to suffer severe complications of pregnancy in childbirth than white women who never graduated from high school. Other data tells us that, despite reaching a record low number of new HIV diagnoses in the city in 2016, there was a 5% increase in new HIV diagnosis among women compared uh, to the prior year. Black and Latina women comprise more than 90% of all newly diagnosed women. And children in low-income communities of color still face disproportionately high rates of asthma, lead poisoning, obesity, dental caries, and other conditions. The department's community-based health action centers in East Harlem, the South Bronx, and Brownsville show enormous promise for helping to tackle these disparities. 
We need additional centers in major low-income parts of the city which are currently underserved, including Jamaica, Rockaways, and the North Shore of Staten Island. I look forward to discussing these and other vital issues with the administration and members of the public today. And I would like to, sit to thank my committee staff, Janet Merrill, Crystal, Sp Crystal Pond, and Zay Emanuel Halu for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. And I'm pleased to have been joined by a stalwart committee member, Alika Amprey Samuel, gets bonus points for punctuality. And now I'll ask our committee counsel to administer the affirmation for the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I so affirm. Good morning, Chair Levine, and uh, I hope soon to be members in plural of the committee. Uh, I'm Dr. Mary Bassett, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I'm joined by Dr. Oxidis Barbeau, our first Deputy Commissioner, and Sandy Raza, Deputy Commissioner for Finance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Department's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019. I'm looking forward to working together to improve the health of all New Yorkers. As this is our first budget hearing together, I'd like to share a bit of background on the department and the principles that guide our work. Our organization covers a wide range of health topics, and I'm proud to say that the department's staff represents the very best in their fields. Our policies and programming on topics as varied as tobacco, restaurant grading, rats, and HIV are widely considered to be the gold standard nationally and internationally. And while the work we do is guided by data and science, under my tenure as commissioner, we have adopted a values-based approach to public health, one where equity is central to our work. In this great city, your zip code should not determine your health. Core to our values at the department is our conviction that every New Yorker and every community should have the opportunity to live their healthiest lives. The focus on equity is critical because although we are making measurable progress in helping New Yorkers live healthier lives, the data show that black and Latino residents often experience higher rates of disease than other New Yorkers. It's important to note that this is not due to biological differences by race. And dear, indeed, we are quite literally all human. Instead, structural racism and a long history of racial and economic inequality have led to these inequities in health. We know that racism, sexism, xenophobia, and other forms of discrimination affect physical and mental health outcomes. And we know that where you live, learn, work, and play matters. By acknowledging these realities and focusing on the social determinants of health, such as housing, education, and transportation, along with more traditional public health issues, the department has adopted strategies that make our work more effective. Chair Levine, I know that you and Speaker Johnson share these beliefs, and I was gratified that your first hearing focused on our Center for Health Equity and its leadership in this endeavor. I'll now turn to some programmatic highlights before discussing the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget. The department has had a busy 2017. We are proud to have made several recent announcements <coughs> regarding capital projects, including last week's grand reopening of the Chelsea Sexual Health Clinic and the selection of a location for the Bronx Animal Shelter. We also released the LGBTQ Bill of Rights which reiterates that healthcare providers and their staff are legally obligated to provide LGBTQ people with high quality health care. It is both wrong and illegal to provide lower quality of care because of sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression. In 2017, we also launched the Maternal Mortality Morbidity Review Committee, which brings together healthcare providers, community-based organizations, researchers, and first responders to review maternal deaths and, quote, near misses, to collectively learn from these tragedies. Severe maternal morbidities are pregnancy-related complications that threaten the health of the mother. These represent one of the starkest health disparities in our city, one that you've just alluded to. A black woman with a college degree or higher is more likely to have serious complications during childbirth than a white woman with less than a high school education. 
The review committee will increase our vigilance and understanding of these events, and it's just one of the department's efforts to address this very serious public health issue. Finally, together with the council, we work to pass a package of tobacco-related bills that keeps New York City at the forefront of tobacco control in the nation. Tobacco use remains the leading cause of preventable deaths in the United States, and there are still more than 850,000 adult smokers in New York City. These new laws will help decrease the number of smokers by 160,000 by 2020, saving many lives and bringing New York City's smoking rate to a historically low 12%. I will now turn to the preliminary budget. The department currently has approximately 6,000 employees and an operating budget of 1.6 billion, of which 700 million is city tax levy. The remainder is federal, state, and private dollars. In fiscal year 2019 preliminary plan, the department received an additional 3.5 million for co-response expansion under NYC SAFE, 1.1 million for comprehensive drug and alcohol misuse program to help address substance use issues among LGBTQ youth, and $1 million to implement the Neighborhood Rat Reduction Plan. Last summer, the mayor announced the city's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Plan, a $32 million multi-agency <coughs> initiative that builds on the department's existing and successful rat reduction programs and focuses on neighborhoods with the highest burden of rat activity. For fiscal year 2019, the department has been allocated $1 million to hire staff, purchase rat resistance waste receptacles, known as big bellies, develop a widespread public awareness campaign, and stand up stoppage teams to plug, plug rat burrows. Through the plan, we are implementing innovative rat prevention, inspection, and control approaches with our sister agencies, and we are looking forward to conducting a robust evaluation of these efforts and anticipate seeing measurable declines in rat activity in targeted areas. Though we have a separate budget hearing on this later today, I want to acknowledge our ongoing work to address mental health and substance misuse. We are now in the third year of the city's Thrive NYC initiative and beginning the second year of Healing NYC. Just yesterday, the mayor and the first lady announced an additional $22 million per year to address the opioid epidemic. This will include funds for the department, to expand the Real A Peer Intervention in Hospitals program, uh, establish the End Overdose Training Institute to train New Yorkers on how to administer and distribute naloxone, and expand crisis response services to address the health needs of individuals referred to us through law enforcement and first responders. We are grateful for this continued funding from the city, but reductions in resources at the state and federal levels have deep and tangible effects on services we are able to provide to the public. As the governor and legislature finalize the state's fiscal year 2019 budget this month, I'd like to flag for you two areas for con of concern for the department. First, over the past 10 years, funding for tuberculosis control efforts has declined by nearly 50% including a 20% state reduction last year and a proposed reduction in fiscal year 2019. This is particularly concerning because for the first time in several decades, we are seeing an increase in TB cases in New York City. There was a 23% increase in the first four months of calendar year 2017 compared to the same period in calendar year 2016. Additionally, there was a 20% state cut to school-based health center grants in fiscal year 2018. Through these centers, students can access comprehensive medical care, dental, vision, and mental health services at no out-of-pocket cost. As a result of this budget reduction, school-based health centers have already begun to close, and as many as 20 may be forced to close their doors at the end of the current school year. Given the uncertainty at the federal level, now is not the time to cut healthcare services provided by these safety net institutions. I'm thankful that the assembly addressed these concerns in their one house budget bill. I encourage you to speak to your state colleagues about the need for robust public health funding by both the city and the state to keep New Yorkers healthy. Finally, I'll turn to the current environment at the federal level. Through policy proposals and proposed budget cuts and tens of millions, the White House has made clear that it does not share our mission of protecting the health of all New Yorkers. 
The words diversity, fetus, transgender, ven vulnerable, entitlement, science-based, evidence-based have been chided as, quote, bad words by this federal administration, but they will remain at the core of what we do at the department day in and day out. As public health experts, it is our job to acknowledge and address health inequities. It is our job to use evidence-based approaches to prevent the leading causes of death, including heart disease and cancer. Despite the continued attacks on prevention and public health fund, it is our job to respond to disease outbreaks. To dismantle the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid, it is our job to ensure that everyone, regardless of immigration status, has access to health care. And it is our job to speak out as people continue to die due to lax gun control laws and the inability of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to conduct research on the subject. Regardless of what terms Washington deems permissible, we will continue to serve vulnerable populations, embrace diversity, and use evidence and science-based solutions to protect and promote the health of all 8.5 million New Yorkers. We are able to do this because of the rich network of local elected officials, community-based organizations, and members of the public with whom we work. I want to thank the mayor and the city council for sharing our commitment to public health, and I look forward to the next four years of partnership. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bassett. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Health Committee member Dr. Matthew Eugene. Welcome. Um, I just want to understand this, Dr. Bassett. So we're facing an increase in tuberculosis cases. I think you said it was 23 percent, an increase over the prior year, but we're facing a decrease in funding. That's correct, but let me just correct one thing. The data that I cited for you are from the, you saw them in the preliminary mayor's uh, management report, are for the first four months of, uh, of the cal this calendar year, 2017, compared to the previous four months of 2016. So it's right. not whole year numbers. So, so that would be. But in any case, it went up by 23%. And we know that when we look at our year on year numbers, we will have an uptick in tuberculosis cases. Yeah. And the budget has been cut. That's uh, it, correct. And it has been cut be, by, uh, by because of the state's budget in the prior fiscal year. Is that correct? It's been cut and cut over the last decade reductions in federal funding as well as to reductions in state funding and reductions, uh, frankly, by the, ci by the city as well. What, what uh, is the budget today? Most recently, uh, the, the, um, the most recent uh, uh, assault has been a proposed state cut of 20 percent. And last year, we took a 20 percent budget cut. We'll be unable to patch over service requirements that as currently delivered in the program uh, unless we can adjust this budget gap. So in it, uh, terms of the total budget for the TB program, it's $14 million. And what was it at its peak? Uh, it was at least twice that. We used to, you know, we have cut our number of staff in half. We now run only two clinics full time. Two clinics are open on a part time basis, so we have four clinics citywide. And as I've said, uh, there, there's been an uptick. For those of us who've been around for a while, this has an eerie uh, uh, echo with prior experience where the TB program was cut and uh, we saw the nut rates of TB go up. We don't want to see that happen again. And, and unfortunately, the people who are most vulnerable to TB are people who are suffering from other conditions, including, I believe, HIV and other. That's true, and that underlay the, uh, the historic upcrease, uptick. But now we have, you know, we've been making great progress with addressing the HIV uh, uh, prevalence in our population and putting people on treatment. Most of the people who have TB in our city are people who acquired infection in another country. They're immigrants, uh, mostly from Asia, also Latin America. Well, we will certainly join you in the fight for, uh, against the cuts from Albany, but you're also saying that the city has cut funding to the program. Is that correct? That's true. Uh, but as I, just to reiterate, uh, those, our recent cuts, uh, that one that we're most concerned about right now, have been by the state and what is as the well city's as federal. What's the city's contribution to the 14.4 million? Uh, I'll, I'll have to, I can, I can ask, uh, it's 64%. <laughs> okay, 
Uh, all right, so that's so we about have Article 10 million, Six match on our uh, about 10 million, let's yeah, call it. That's so, right. what would that have been at his peak? Uh, I, I'll have to get you the historic um, budget numbers, but in aggregate, I can reiterate that we've seen a 50% reduction in funding for TB over the last decade. All right, well, I'm, I'm all for pushing back on state cuts, and we'll join you and advocates in that fight, but we also have to hold ourselves accountable. Yes. And if yes. we're cutting and our own budget, then we're, we have to share some of the blame, too. Yes, and we are in discussions about the TB bu bu budgets uh, here at City Hall. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there are 650,000 uninsured adults in the five boroughs. Tell me if I have my numbers approximately right. And That's approximately right. Okay. And about 350,000 of them um, are eligible for some form of insurance. That could be uh, an essential plan on the state exchange, for example. In some cases, they could even be eligible for Medicaid, um, yet have not signed up. Um, it is so important that we get those people signed up for their own health, first and foremost. But as you well know, um, this has implications for the whole city, uh, and partly because the health of one New Yorker due to contagious diseases affects the health of all of us, but there's also a colder um, financial incentive, which is that our public hospitals um, are losing money every day because they can't bill uh, through federal and state funding streams for these patients. So. This is, it's so imperative. And I want to congratulate the city on signing up an additional 80,000 this year under Get Covered in NYC. In this climate, with the attacks on Obamacare, uh, that's amazing. Uh, I think people who are not informed might have thought when they see the headlines that the program is imploding and might be discouraged from applying, um, yet it doesn't remain very important that they do so. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. We have 350,000 more people that we need to get signed up. Can you explain um, the funding we're allocated, we've allocated to this effort, uh, the staffing we've allocated, uh, some who are actually are DOHMH employees, but there are, this is really a multi-agency effort. Um, could you explain the broader picture of, of how the city is attacking uh, this challenge? The, the, first, um, the first activity of the department has been to ensure that everybody who's in, uh, eligible for health care coverage under the Affordable Care Act signs up for it. And through those efforts, we've made enormous strides in reducing the number of uninsured people. It now stands at something under 8 percent of adults in the city. We've reduced it by at least 30 percent uh, with the advent of the Affordable Care Act. And the health department works with uh, the um, uh, other, um, uh, other groups in the city, other city agencies, including uh, a, uh, an active, a group at City Hall that is responsible for public outreach and our, our colleagues at uh, Health and Hospitals to promote enrollment in getting people covered. Uh, so getting covered has been a key activity. We have our own enrollers. We enroll at clinics and at pop-up sites and have contributed in getting towards that 80,000 number that you, uh, that you complimented us on, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, that's our principal contribution uh, to make sure that people who are, can get covered get covered. Uh, additionally, there are people, uh, as you're aware, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, who, are, um, who are not eligible under the Affordable Care Act. Well, I, I, you, you mean people who, though they are uh, citizens or legal residents, are ineligible because they are No, there are very few of those. It, right. uh, the, the main people cut out of the Affordable Care Act are the undocumented. undocumented. Numbers, which I, I, I want to talk about. That's of great importance to, to me and to the committee. But just to focus on the issue of, again, people who are insurable under the current system. What, how many staff are you devoted, have you devoted out of DOHMH uh, to this effort? Uh, I'm going to ask if I can be joined by one of our deputy commissioners, but we have, uh, we have 30 certified application uh, counselors who do insurance enrollment. Uh, as you know, this is a complex pro process. Everybody who's ever had to pick their insurance plan knows that it's hard to decide among the many options. Uh, so it's quite time consuming, and we have 30 
uh, certified uh, application enrollers who work with members of the public to sign up for health insurance. Uh, we uh, do this in multiple languages, um, meaning that we have people who speak both uh, English, Spanish, uh, and uh, um, Cantonese, I think it is. Uh, but additionally, we have an a, a interpretation line which enables us to work with people in, in, in literally scores of languages. Right, and so what is the budget for our enrollment efforts? Okay, so, sorry, if you could just... just introduce yourself. Yes, and we'll, we'll do the affirmation. Sonia Angel, Deputy Commissioner. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I affirm. So the question was, what is our budget? And I have it in my book, but I don't have it in my memory. And uh, our budget was uh, over and above our usual was uh, for the Get Covered campaign, we got no additional funding, so we used our usual budget for our 30 certified uh, application enrollers. Funding, sorry, excuse me. You're, so you're looking for the, bu the, 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 uh, the budget line for this, is that right? Yeah, if you don't want to, I mean, we, uh, we have whatever we pay those 30 individuals. But there was also a large advertising budget. Oh, yes, that didn't come out of our budget. Uh, that was run out of, uh, uh, we may have, we were involved in the uh, development of that campaign. Uh, and the, it may have passed through our budget. Uh, although it didn't What, what uh, budget, if not arise, the health department? Uh, the uh, the um, HRA, the so Department Got of Social it. Services. And do, do you know the, staff, the, staffing that H, the staffing that HRA allocates to this or any other agencies? I don't. I don't know the staffing. I mean, this has been a, a, a big commitment of the administration, as you pointed out in your remarks. And one of the key ways that we see of defending the Affordable Care Act is to ensure that people sign up and get their coverage as long as it's available to us that we ensure that the public is aware of it and utilizes it. As right. a state, we had record numbers of people uh, signed up for the Affordable Care Act. I think proof that despite all of the uh, efforts from Washington to try and describe it as hugely unpopular that people need and are using this, uh, this coverage. Right. Um. I am all for having city government workers focused on this, especially if they're already interacting with members of the public. That would be common at HRA. Um, there are going to be some New Yorkers who are not comfortable walking into a government office to do this. And so there's a parallel effort of CBO-based yes. enrollment as well. Yes. And what is our budget for that piece? Yes, that is not something that we budget to the health department. We do do enrollment in non you know, non sort of uh, social benefits offices through at basically at our health clinics. And additionally, we've been experimenting with using pop-up sites in communities to right. do enrollment. Okay. So um, the additional services that you're talking about, um, uh, we'll just have to turn to our sister agency to get the budget from them. Right, the, the, the state does fund uh, significant CBO outreach Yes, they works. do. Uh, for Community Service Society, yes. I know, has a huge uh, grant from the state and has been uh, very active in enrollment both in our city and across the state. So of the 80,000 that were enrolled this year, how many came from CBOs, how many came from your department's outreach, how many came from HRA? I can give you the number that came from our department, uh, but I can't give you those other numbers. And it will take me a moment to dig up the numbers that came from our department. Uh, but it, we were proud of our efforts, and let's see what I have. Um, do you have it? Because this was a combined effort across the city, working um, with the mayor's office, with HRA, the public engagement unit, I think is what you were referring to also in terms of uh, 
or boots on the ground. We have the uh, aggregate estimate because it was indeed a combined effort. So the PEU, for example, would identify people, refer them to our certified application counselors, as well as potentially the whole network throughout the city. We actually had, uh, uh, in part of the referral process, we tried to make it as convenient as possible for individuals who are identified in need of insurance. So if, if our site was not necessarily the best site for them, we would refer them to others. So 80,000 includes a combined effort of Get Covered NYC, which was the city's initiative. Okay. I think uh, we could probably dig up a number for you if it matters to you, but I, I think the, the, what I hope is important to the health committee is that uh, as a city, we have been committed to getting people signed up, and we've exceeded our goal. The mayor challenged us to deliver 50,000 individuals, and as you've said, the number that, was, uh, that the city um, ha enrolled was 80,000. Right. Well, I'm challenging us to get to all 350,000. Um, that is a big challenge. It's ultimately doable. It will yield huge benefits in the health of um, New Yorkers and fiscal benefits as well. Uh, it seems to me that we need to allocate more resources in that fight. It seems like we have to invest more as a city on the CBO side. And it seems like we need interagency coordination here. Uh, so that we understand across agencies at any given moment the level of resources and um, just what it's yielding. To me, this is a smart investment. All right. Understood. All right. I'm going to pause and uh, see if my colleague, Councilmember Amphrey Samuels, has a question. Please do. Good morning, everyone. Um, the question is related to lead poisoning. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget allocates $8.5 million to the Bureau of Environmental Disease and Injury Prevention. This includes funding to reduce environmental hazards in the home associated with injuries and disease such as lead poisoning. While lead poisoning has nearly been eliminated in many neighborhoods, certain New York City districts continue to experience elevated lead levels. A recent Reuters investigation found 69 New York City census tracts where at least 10% of small children screened over an 11-year period from 2005 to 2015 have elevated lead levels. How does the department ensure it directs its lead prevention and abatement resources to the city's neediest neighborhoods? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Uh, if I could just, uh, since I have the mic, clarify something for the chair, that no, there have been no cuts to the TB program by the city under the, my term as, as, uh, as commissioner or under this administration. Got, got uh, it, just so there were cuts under the prior administration. Correct. Well, we didn't restore those cuts. Correct. Okay, uh, well, that, that's correct. We'll, we'll, we'll be pushing for that. <laughs> All right, council member. Um, I uh, appreciate a question about lead poisoning. As you point out, that we have different levels of exposure across different parts of our city, uh, mostly related to exposure to deteriorated lead paint in parts of the city that have older housing stock. I want to take the opportunity to show House Committee uh, members this graph. I know you can't make out the numbers, but I'm sure you can see the, uh, see the uh, overall idea here. Uh, that we have had a huge reduction in the number of children with elevations above the CDC surveillance level of five micrograms per deciliter uh, over the past uh, now over decade since 2005 when uh, the local law one went into effect. Uh, the overall decline has been 87 percent uh, in the proportion of children with elevated blood lead levels. But could you just give us, but, I couldn't read that, I don't know if, if my colleague could, but um, <laughs> I'd so, be happy so to what, provide what was the you. first year on that chart and what was the level and what was the last year? Okay, so. this is, these are numbers of children with blood lead levels above five, five micrograms per deciliter, which is the surveillance criteria used by the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, that cut point was uh, selected because 95% of children had blood lead levels lower than that. Now, in 2005, uh, we had uh, 37,344 children who fell in that category with blood lead levels greater than 5 micrograms, and the rate per 1,000 children tested was 120.4. 
In 2016, the most recent data for which we have, uh, the most recent year for which we have data available, uh, uh, we had 4,928 children uh, with blood lead levels above five, and the rate was 16.5. Per hundred per thousand children tested, as I said, that represents an 87 percent decline. So I want to make clear that as a city, historically we've been very aggressive on blood lead, uh, uh, on exposure to lead, and on the identification and remediation of exposures, and when we identify elevated blood lead levels in children, that uh, a d part of our success has been of focusing on areas where we have particular concern. And I'm joined by Deputy Commissioner Corinne Schiff, uh, who leads our environmental health program. I'll ask her to speak to those special programs that focus on areas where children have more exposure. Okay, and can you also provide us with information as to where those particular areas are? That would be helpful. Sure. Um, so I, I think it's Sorry, important. Sorry, we just need to do the affirmation. Oh, yes, Corinne Schiff, I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. So to, first to provide some, some context, uh, the, the city has a, a multifaceted approach to, uh, to lead poisoning prevention. Um, as you probably know, every year uh, tenants receive a notice from their landlord asking them to indicate whether there's a child under six in the apartment, and then the property owner has an obligation to check that apartment for peeling paint. The Department of Health's role is to intervene when there's a child with an elevated blood lead level. So every day we get a download of all blood lead testing results from New York City, and every day our Healthy Homes program reviews those results to find children with elevated blood lead levels. We then very quickly follow up with the family to make an appointment, and we do a very, very comprehensive risk assessment with that family to try to identify every source of lead exposure for that child. We also do uh, an investigation in the home using an, a piece of equipment called an XRF that we literally point at the wall for every place where the paint is not intact to take a measurement and to see if that paint is lead paint. If it is, we then order the property owner to remediate. The property owner has only five days to begin that work. We then monitor that work to make sure that it's being, uh, being conducted, and if it's not, we make a referral to HPD which then does complete the, uh, the abatement. And then the property owner will receive a violation from us subject to fines. So that's sort of in brief um, the, the approach that we take. And, and as Dr. Bassett has pointed out, we've had really quite a lot of success uh, since uh, Local Law 1 has gone into effect. We do also have a very active surveillance program, so we know where in the city there are hot spots. Um, as, as you have noted, it's not uh, equally distributed throughout the city. It's, the main exposure for children remains lead paint, and so it's really um, tied to the, the housing stock um, and the, um, the quality of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the housing stock. And so, for example, some of the areas where we're doing a lot of work are in um, Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and we take a really community-based approach uh, working with organizations, local organizations in those communities to, uh, to reach tenants, to reach property owners, property managers, teaching them about uh, abatement, uh, safe work, uh, all a very um, multifaceted approach to that. But every child where we receive a result of an elevated blood lead level gets our attention. Okay, and just one last follow up, okay. Um, has the city addressed the potentially unsafe lead levels in the backyard soil of some of the homes in the Greenpoint, Brooklyn area? You mentioned Williamsburg, but I received notice about Greenpoint. Sorry, you were speaking about lead in the soil? Yes. Well, we, uh, again, the principal exposure that we find uh, is uh, exposure to deteriorated lead paint. So that means both flaking paint and something that we call lead dust, which is from, it's literally dust that accumulates as the paint chips deteriorate. Uh, exposure to lead in, uh, in the soil is not a, a key exposure for uh, elevated blood lead level. Uh, but when we learn of it, uh, we do work with the Department of Environmental uh, Protection. Uh, that, 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 yeah. And, and we do, we do um, 
there have been some reports, um, as Dr. Bassett has mentioned, lead paint is really the primary exposure. Um, lead poisoning results from ingestion, and so uh, concerns about backyard soil could be when children are playing and, and literally eat when they're playing in the dirt, mm -hmm. and children, as we know, put their hands in their mouths. We have guidance um, for uh, people about um, if they're going to do gardening in their backyard to use raised container beds for, for that gardening, to, to wash toys, but really our primary concern is paint. All right, thank you. Thank you, council member. So I just wanna uh, emphasize a point you touched upon, but while we've made great progress, as your graph showed citywide, there are pockets of the city where the rates are alarmingly high, I think as high as 10% in some neighborhoods, 10% of the kids, do I have that right, in some neighborhoods, are testing positive, which is higher than Flint. Let me let me look at the uh, get the number for you here. Right. So uh, we talked about Williamsburg in Brooklyn, for example. Williamsburg, uh, yeah. Where yeah. Uh, if if the rate is not 10 percent, can you tell me what you would expect it to be in the worst neighborhoods? Uh, I, I am not aware of uh, neighborhoods, whole neighborhoods that have a rate of 10% okay. uh, or I even sectors of the population, say, by, by income group that have I'm, a rate I'm, that I'm high. I'm looking at... Uh, uh, but there are, there are uh, certainly there is what people used to refer to as a lead belt in, in Brooklyn, and uh, Williamsburg is uh, at the heart of that area. That's why we have additional efforts to ensure that that community is aware of its potential lead exposure. Uh, right, so it looks like Reuters did an investigation on this uh, with data from 2005 to 2015. Uh, over that 11-year period, they found 69 New York City census tracts where at least 10% of small children screened had elevated blood levels. So as, as Dr. Bassett said, we do have uh, particular interventions in hotspots like Williamsburg, and we're working, the, the housing stock <clears throat> in that neighborhood is, is old and uh, crowded, and that leads to um, degradate, further degradation of paint and um, additional risks for children. And so we have had a special focus in that community um, to reach families. Parts of that community are very insulated. Um, so we have been doing a work through the community-based organizations who are best able to, to reach families um, in, in, the, in the language that they use um, to uh, make sure the families know about bringing their children for testing and also to work with the property managers there to make sure that they understand the law about inspecting apartments and um, correcting my, lead paint. My, my notes say that it's in the Hasidic neighborhood section of Williamsburg. That's correct. Uh, so do we have Yiddish language outreach? We do. You have staff, Yiddish speaking staff? We have, uh, our publications are in Yiddish and let me, that we would have very detailed questions, so we need to bring up the people who are. So we, we, so we, <laughs> we, we, we aim to deliver on that <laughs> promise. <laughs> so we, um, we, are, we have publications that are in Yiddish, and we do the work through the community-based organizations, We not only for, for reasons of language, but for reasons of, for, for cultural access. So our work is through, uh, we fund community-based organizations, and we work with them to, to, to train them and to deliver those messages. So it is in, it is in the, the spoken language. So you're funding uh, community-based groups in the Hasidic areas of Williamsburg? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'd like to follow up with you on that for sure. Um, I want to turn to the opioid crisis, which, which you have been focused on and correctly um, addressed in your uh, opening remarks, and we were excited about the announcement yesterday of additional resources and additional strategies. Um, as, as you and I have spoken about, uh, this is a tough disease to shake, uh, opioid addiction. Uh, am I right to use the word disease in this context? It's certainly preferable to crime. Okay, well, I, w I, would, I w would not make that mistake. Um, it is properly understood as a public health challenge. I think we would all agree uh, that upon correct. that. And uh, the success rate of people who completely kick this addiction is um, vanishingly small. That does not mean that 
opioid addiction has to be a death sentence. And it doesn't even mean that people who are struggling with this addiction um, cannot lead productive lives. There are many, many examples of people who um, have been able to manage um, this condition. Um, we have in instituted some innovat innovative strategies to help do that, one of which is uh, needle exchanges, which 20 years ago were considered uh, radical and risky, and today I think are accepted almost universally in the public health landscape as just being a, smart, a smart, smart and evidence supported intervention. Um, we are engaged in a similar today, a debate today about safe injection facilities, um, which um, provide a professionally supervised setting um, for people to self-inject, um, which can uh, prevent fatality and can provide a context to offer wraparound uh, social services, which we know are so important and effective. Um, do, do you accept uh, what I think is a, an emerging consensus of the effectiveness of these sites? I think that the public health literature is clear. Uh, the public health literature is clear in establishing the effectiveness That's correct. of those sites. Um, there, are, there are other parts of the world which are already successfully instituting such programs, correct? Not in the United States. Right, other parts of the world, other countries though. That's correct. Correct, so we're, we're, we're behind the times on this domestically. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to accept that as a ringing endorsement of <laughs> safe injection facilities. We're happy to hear that. Um, we are, of course, awaiting uh, a report which the City Council funded um, that we think would be a, a big step forward in establishing uh, the viability and working out some of the logistical and legal questions. What can you tell us about when we can expect this report? So first, let me just add a little bit to the history lesson that you appropriately reminded us of with syringe exchange programs. There, unfortunately, remain states in the United States which do not endorse uh, and, are, and where syringe exchange is not in place. You may recall uh, that the Vice President was convinced by our now Surgeon General to permit syringe exchange uh, for the first time uh, in the, in, when faced with a cluster of uh, of injection drug use associated HIV transmission. Uh, but anyway, turning to the question that you've asked, uh, as you know, I expect, uh, because you, I'm sure, are aware of the announcements made yesterday, uh, the, the mayor has, uh, has committed, as did the first lady, to a, uh, an April release of the report and the administration's response to the report. Well, uh Given that we have a scientifically proven method to prevent fatality um, and that we have a, an enlightened health commissioner who seems to acknowledge that science, I just think it's imperative that we move forward on this. I understand there are, are legal complications. Um, I would say let's barrel forward and if the federal government wants to sue us, we'll take on that fight. That was exactly the challenge that we confronted as a society 20 years ago on syringe exchanges. I think the stakes are high enough that um, we shouldn't let that fear of, of being sued by the federal government uh, stop us from this important effort. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, a matter I know you're passionate about, which is community-based um, public health efforts, which you have um, really ramped up in select neighborhoods with your community health action centers, one of which I visited in East Harlem recently. Uh, it, it's, it's clearly an impactful model. Uh, we're in three neighborhoods right now with this kind of um, full-blown, multi-purpose um, public health facility on the ground, uh, which as I mentioned is in East Harlem, in Brownsville, and also in the South Bronx. Uh, this is a big city and there are many neighborhoods with large numbers of low-income residents, communities of color which don't have such a facility. I identified three, which is Jamaica, um, the, uh, the, the Rockaways Peninsula, and the North Shore of Staten Island. There are, I believe, at least in Jamaica and the North Shore, um, 
vacant public health, former district public health offices um, that were built decades ago and have since been closed um, that would offer a great location. Um, do you have plans to expand this model to other needy neighborhoods? Could these shuttered facilities uh, be the place to do it? Um, and what would it cost to move forward in these communities? Uh, thank you for highlighting the importance of community-based public health. Uh, the three neighborhoods in which the health department began first with what we call district public health offices and now uh, we call neighborhood health action centers are the communities in our city that have the highest disease burden. I re-examined this when I became commissioner because I wanted to make sure that we were focusing our efforts in the areas where uh, the disease burden was highest using as a metric premature mortality, that's death before the age of 65. These remain the highest priority areas. Uh, to answer specifically your question, uh, we have uh, what we call neighborhood health action center buildings uh, that have been spruced up and uh, had some additional investments in both the building and in staff, and the uh, dollar figure on that is about a million dollars per building. Right. Look, in the context of an $86 billion budget, that is less than a rounding error. I think that the public health benefits of investing a million dollars uh, in one of these communities would far uh, exceed uh, the expense. Everyone loves to cite Mayor LaGuardia as a progressive hero. He opened 30 of these offices. He I built only 14, though. <laughs> What's that? He only was able to build 14. The big, the depression intervened. But yes, he op he identified 30 health districts in the city, and it uh, was a prescient strategy. So maybe it was Mayor 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 uh, Wagner who was the progressive hero in this case. I don't know who <laughs> finished the project, but I believe that there are 12 now. Uh, that are not in use for public health purposes. There are some great examples. Uh, for example, the new Chelsea facility, uh, which if you read the writing on the door, it says district health office, so we know the origin of that. Um, but um, it just doesn't seem to make sense to leave these buildings shuttered in neighborhoods which today are facing um, uh, inequitable health outcomes, um, that we don't do more to meet their needs on the ground. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by another stalwart committee member, Keith Powers from Manhattan. Thank you. Um, this is a day of multiple simultaneous hearings, um, so uh, you'll have to excuse my colleagues who are running in and out. Um, I want to ask you about food and diet at a time when, um, if you look at the diseases which are topping the charts of leading causes of death in New York City, um, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, they are directly related to diet uh, in a way, and I, th I think this is more true today than it was uh, in decades past, maybe you can confirm that, but it's certainly unavoidable that unless we tackle um, diet amongst New Yorkers, we are never going to be able to completely beat these diseases, and um, uh, one of the main culprits uh, is sugar. And one of the main culprits for excessive sugar intake is sugary drinks. Um, say what you will about the Bloomberg era. Uh, they were aggressive in tackling uh, sugar intake, in some cases unsuccessfully because of political and legal challenges. But in the meantime, this problem hasn't gone away. And uh, the intake of sugary soda, which unfortunately uh, disproportionately affects uh, low-income communities, uh, and communities of color uh, remains a persistent challenge. So what is the department's strategy uh, for more aggressively tackling this challenge? Uh, thank you for that question. Your uh, summation is correct. Uh, a large share of our current disease burden is chronic disease. That comprises, we estimate, about 80 percent of the causes of death. And what some people have referred to as the real underlying causes of death are not heart disease. and cancer and diabetes, but unhealthy food and lack of physical activity. Uh, so I agree with your framing of this issue. In public health, we take a prevention approach, and a lot of our work regarding these diseases has focused on diet. As you're aware, uh, the, the mayor uh, supported, and we continue to 
uh, to fight for the idea of calorie posting. We were ready to extend calorie posting to supermarkets where they serve prepared foods uh, when much to our surprise, I'll, I'll say, um, it, it surprised me, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, whose rules these were, uh, declared just days before implementation that they wanted to defer it for another year. When we said we were ready, uh, they showed up in court to side with industry and to challenge the city threatening preemption. Uh, we are waiting for these to go into effect in May. Uh, so we've been pushing for the policy, policy strategies that have long, uh, long been an important part of our approach to healthy food. We also continue our work with neighborhood stores, uh, trying to improve the offerings in neighborhood stores. And there are lots of strategies that I was never aware of until uh, we started work in this area uh, that make people more likely to buy healthy foods, putting water at eye level, uh, healthy snacks at the checkout counter, putting fruit in line of sight when you enter one of uh, the neighborhood stores. So we work with b small business owners to do this work. Uh, additionally, we have succeeded in putting uh, uh, labels of high sodium, which is an important risk factor for high blood pressure, uh, on uh, the menus and menu boards of uh, the food service establishments that we regulate in the city. But as you point out, uh, we did have a loss with uh, our efforts uh, in the previous administration to limit the serving size of sugary beverages. And our Board of Health is uh, f following a decision made in June of 2014 is really effectively barred from uh, work in this area. It has been deferred to the legislative arena and we have seen no legislation. Right, but are you considering um, new strategies, the kinds ha that have been considered and rejected, uh, limitations yes, on? Yes, we are in discussions. This is an important issue, and additionally, our data, as you're aware, show that the kind of um, the uh, associated benefit of all of the uproar around what people improperly referred to as a soda ban was associated with a steeper decline in uh, reported soda consumption. A sugary beverage consumption has leveled off. Uh, our study in children showed that 50% of, uh, of black and Latino children drink uh, a soda or sugary beverage uh, once a day. So, uh, sorry, so, so we are concerned about this issue. Uh, and as, are as are we. So, but are you considering uh, portion control, uh, limitations on labeling and signage, or other strategies? What the, what remain, we're exploring the options that remain open to us. Portion control does not remain open to the Board of Health, but warning labels have. That's how we succeeded with, uh, with the sodium warning labels. That's a possibility. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Keith Powers, who has a question, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for, and sorry I missed your testimony, but I'm, I'm catching up and it looks like you covered a lot and I'll, it looks like the, our chair did a great job covering a lot of territory. I wanted to kind of continue just a couple questions on the food, uh, the food and health, nutrition aspect of it, which is, I think the chair got to a crux of my question, but is there any legislation that the Department of Health is seeking related to whether it's portion control? I think, because I think your point is the Board of Health doesn't have that jurisdiction, but the City Council may, and, and maybe, maybe could correct me if I'm wrong, but is there any legislation that you are seeking or requesting? No, there's not at this time. At this time. And, but and I the, appreciate your flagging an important public health issue. And, and why not? And just a basic question, if it sounds like you might support the concept, but is there reason you're not looking at a legislative solution for it? Well, to be honest, the, my favorite strategy here would be a soda tax, which has been uh, taken up in many other jurisdictions. But as you wear, that is something that our governor has been unwilling to entertain. And what, what amount of a tax do you think is effective? Other jurisdictions have used a penny an ounce or two pennies an ounce. 20 cents on a 20 cent soda. And that, oh. is, that, is there evidence that that discourages consumption? Yes. Interesting. What states and, or cities have that currently? Uh, I don't believe any states have done it, but uh, jurisdictions include several in California, including Berkeley, San Francisco, the city of Philadelphia has a soda tax. Uh, it was one of the bright spots of the election, to be honest, uh, that uh, several other jurisdictions passed. Uh, um, uh, I don't know what they call it when the public votes directly for something. 
uh, uh, and, and adopted soda taxes, I think uh, Boulder, Colorado. We can get you a list of the jurisdictions. Got it. There are now several. And, and you know, often here in the city council where, where we, we you know, sort of comment on the loss of power, responsibility to Albany and the inability to get things done because of, you know, of, of sort of multi-party politics in Albany and, and the dynamic up there. But I, I do think there are things at the city level that we should look at on all on, across the board to not have to always look at Albany as our solution and then say we don't have support there. Perhaps just a comment uh, is we could work something as much as possible down here, whether it's it's increased warnings and education or it's it's actually looking at more ways to control. And I would go beyond sugar. Maybe it's salt and maybe it's other other areas as well. Are there other any other areas outside of sugary beverages which we just touched on that the department's concerned about in terms of nutrition and portion control? The the main one really is uh, the the problem of added sugar. And uh, we welcome uh, the openness of this committee and the council more generally to have conversations about this issue. We'd be happy, I'd be happy to continue the conversation. Great, thank you. And I wanted to switch to, uh, to flu, because I know this is particularly a year where a lot of people were, were getting the flu, and I know I think access to the shot or, or, or uh, uh, just going out and getting it itself still remains, I think, I, I assume, below where, where the department and the city would like to see it. Can you give us any updates on efforts at the city level, either both public and private, to increase the access to the flu shot, and, and particularly this year, any extra steps that were taken? Sure, uh, this, as you point out, this year was a, a, a bad year in terms of circulating flu. It wasn't a pandemic year, uh, but it was just high levels of a usual flu, and it was a bad, uh, a bad strain of the flu. Uh, H3N2 uh, is one that's, uh, that the vaccine uh, typically is not that effective against, although it turned out that it was about 36% effective. Maybe, many of you may have heard the press talking about under 20%, 19%, or 17%. Anyway, it turned out it was more effective than that. Uh, a, key, um, a, a, a key place to get um, the uh, flu shot is in local pharmacies, and pharmacies were, uh, really have increased our, our, uh, our proportion of the population that gets flu shots. Uh, we were pleased that the governor uh, issued an order that uh, children over the age of two could get their shots. Uh, the cut point before was that you had to be 18 or older. Uh, we have supported that and advocated for it in Albany for a long time, and I'm pleased that the state is going to go forward with legislation for that. In addition, as you probably are aware, the uh, administration worked to make more flu shots available at no cost. We had a private-public partnership uh, with one of the big pharmacy chains and made 1,000 vaccines available uh, in community, focusing on communities where we are, have particular concerns. Uh, we also work to promote flu vaccines in our school-based health centers, uh, which, uh, of which we have nearly 160 across the school system. And uh, we, you know, did see an uptick in, uh, in, in the uptake of flu vaccines related to the circulating news that we were facing a bad flu season. I got it. And, and the, the, the order you refer to is from the governor? That was from the governor. That was like an executive order to allow younger... Allow New pharmacies York. to immunize younger children. And, and in fact, most of them weren't that interested in immunizing two-year-olds. I don't think anybody wants to have a screaming toddler in their right. store. Right. So in, in, in practice, it was uh, children the age of seven and eight. Uh, uh, old, oh yeah, seven, eight, seven, eight younger, eight. kids able to, uh, you know, to roll up their sleeve and take a shot. <laughs> Got it. And, so and this uh, this was a good thing, and we're glad that the that the um, that the governor has proposed that it be made permanent. Got it. Are there other vaccinations that the city would like to see where local uh, yes. uh, can provide a vaccination, um, but aren't currently alive? Because I assume, I mean, I, my position here is like 
that's a that is a critical access point for a lot of people, and we shouldn't have to go to Albany every to every time to it. But are there other vaccinations that the city doesn't? Have, I, I recall the city doesn't have authority on a lot of vaccinations, or, or the local pharmacist doesn't have. Well, it would have to be the state that would make this, uh, but we, we would like to see pharmacies with a larger portfolio of vaccines that they could make available uh, to, to adults uh, and which, children. And which vaccine? Which vaccine? Uh, I could get you the list, or I could ask if one of my deputies could give it to you today, but I'd be happy to give you that list. But that remains uh, 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 under the authority of the State Health Department. As you may be aware, uh, we are still in court uh, defending our... Uh, our, uh, our desire to make uh, certain vaccine requirements mandatory in, in daycare centers. Uh, we've been challenged by the state on this and we're in the court uh, defending it. Uh, I don't know if our, is our general counsel here? No, our general counsel is not here. So I really um, uh, can't tell you more about the details of that case, but we uh, continue to litigate the right of the city to determine uh, uh, vaccination requirements in our city regulated child care centers, but uh, we have been challenged. We wanted to make um, it, it a, re a requirement that children get flu shots. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Um, I understand that on a citywide basis we had adequate supplies of vaccine testing and Tamiflu, but there were definitely uh, localized um, shortages. Uh, I myself, when I uh, came down with the flu, uh, my doctor's office didn't have any testing kits. So I was prescribed Tamiflu uh, based on the intuition of the, of the doctor. Um, I may ask, council yeah, member. Yeah, yes, you may, and, and, and I, I would be, <laughs> I would have to resign my chairmanship if I had not been. <laughs> and yes, I was. Next year, maybe you can administer the shot so there's no ambiguity. And I will say that I recovered in two days, which I'm attributing to having been vaccinated. Um, one of the benefits, of course, as you know, is, is a quicker recovery. So, um, but, but we've heard certainly anecdotal reports of, of lack of availability of testing, of Tamiflu, and I think even in some cases of uh, particularly, I think, pediatric uh, vaccination. So how do we grapple with this problem where the city on the whole has supply, but clearly not every provider does. As you point out, uh, contrary to previous years where we have had shortages in this past season, which actually remains ongoing, although it's clearly on the downturn, uh, we have had uh, no shortages of either vaccine or Tamiflu. Uh, so the problem is simply one of projected demand. Uh, and uh, because we had a, a, a worse than usual flu season, the demand for the vaccine rose, and not all facilities were uh, equipped for the increased demand. It sounds like the place that you went to wasn't. So they should have been able to replenish their stocks and uh, and make it make it available. The shortage of testing, I'm I'm not as sure about. Uh, so I would have to get back to you on that. Uh, but I'm positive that we had no shortage of either uh, Tamiflu or the vaccine. And I've been joined by the Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control, Dr. Daskalakis. If you could introduce yourself and be sworn in for the committee, and perhaps you can tell us about the problems that the chair has mentioned Thank regarding you. testing. Um, we'll do the I'm Thank you, Dr. Okay. Yeah, Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do affirm. Um, so specifically on the issue of testing kit availability, um, we, we did not detect any abnormalities in terms of availability of kits in terms of supply side. There are, are generally spot shortages because a clinic, a doctor's office won't order enough. So what isn't there one day, will be there the next day. But an important note, your doctor did the right thing. So the um, rapid influenza test is really good at confirming influenza. If you had influenza symptoms and that test were, were negative, you would probably still need to get Tamiflu. 
So in other words, it's nice to have that information, but clinical suspicion is enough to move. And thankfully, there was no supply side problem with Tamiflu. Again, some pharmacies did have spot shortages. So one day they wouldn't have it, but when they ordered it, it would arrive. And how do we tackle the persistent inequity in the rates of vaccination? If I have my numbers correct, I believe that for white New Yorkers, it's 69%, and for African-American New Yorkers, it's 50%. Yeah, that is correct. This has been a protracted problem. Uh, we continue to do outreach to communities which have historically uh, under underutilized vaccine uh, for flu, uh, and we'll just keep working at it. Uh, by through education and outreach. I would just want to use this as an opportunity to remind everybody that we want people to start getting their flu shots in September uh, so that they've been immunized in advance of flu season, which typically begins in October. And it's still not too late to get a flu shot. Uh, the flu season runs through May. Well, given that we're having a nor'easter tomorrow, I think people understand <laughs> that uh, winter and the flu season are not over yet. Um, on the topic of family planning, uh, incredibly, the Trump administration, as I alluded to in my opening remarks, uh, is redefining the parameters for funding in this area. Um, they, uh, we are currently getting five million in federal funding for our Bureau of Sexually Transmitted Disease Control, and the Trump administration's application for family planning funding now emphasizes uh, abstinence and uh, Natural family planning, that has got to be the euphemism of the year. Uh, I had to dig around and I found out that they were referring to the rhythm method uh, with that term. So do we, are we even going to reapply under, under such uh, restrictions for that five million? And if not, how are we going to maintain those services? Well, we're certainly committed to maintaining access to contraception in the city. We've valued our collaboration with Planned Parenthood of New York uh, over the years. Uh, uh, and we, as you're aware, also offer uh, contraception at our sexual health clinics. We'll just have to look at this. This is what they're proposing uh, and, uh, and make a determination. Uh, we certainly are, intend to seek every federal dollar that we can use for our programming. Okay, um, so not everyone knows that inspection of child care uh, facilities is under your auspices. We have um, dramatically expanded the number of pre-K programs in the city and now adding 3K, that's great news. Um, mo me me most or at least many of those programs are not in public school buildings. And they are in a hodgepodge of settings from basements to storefronts to converted apartments. Uh, and so we have to have inspectors in there to make sure that they're safe, that they're not exposed radiators or uh, windows that it's easy for a little kid to fall out of. Uh, uh, perhaps even lead paint is part of that process, I don't know. But um, we, need, we need professionals in there to make sure that this is safe for a four-year-old or a three-year-old. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the number of safety inspectors has not risen in proportion to the growth in the number of programs. You call this title, I think, Early Childhood Education Consultant, ECEC, I know is the acronym. Um, uh, I believe that you've had a hard time attracting and retaining and that perhaps there are not enough budget lines. Can you tell us, um, have we maintained the proportion of inspectors to programs as we've grown this? Uh, system throughout the city? Well, that's a really good question. And uh, the, you are correct. The uh, child care program is responsible for the inspection, and permitting, and licensing on behalf of the state of, uh, uh, of our, both our um, child care centers, uh, which are regulated by the city, and family and group family daycare. Uh, which are under state jurisdiction, but we regulate on their behalf. I'm, uh, there are two uh, parts of the way we look at child care. One is the, what you mentioned about the physical environment and its safety, that it meets fire code, building code, 
uh, and, uh, and, um, and our safety requirements. And then we are concerned that the people working in childcare are appropriately trained professionals, that there's an educational director for the child care center, so that the content of the experience uh, is, uh, um, is provided by appropriately trained people. It's that latter part that is the usual, is the usual uh, responsibility of the ECECs, the Early Childhood uh, Educational Consultants, and our inspectors are the ones who go to make sure that the number of children meets the license, that they're the right number of staff, and that the um, and that the physical environment is appropriate. Right, and, and so we greatly have greatly bolstered uh, our ex inspection program, and a couple of years ago increased the number of inspectors. Um, to my knowledge, we are able to meet the requirements of uh, of, of inspection that the current portfolio uh, demands. And do, uh, do you know how many inspectors we have today and what that number would have been before the growth of I don't, I don't, but I, I know that we have about 2,300 child care centers and I don't know how many people we have or how many vacant suits we have. If my deputy commissioner has that information, I can ask her to, um, to provide it. We'll get back to you with the exact numbers, but I will say that as the, um, with the rollout of UPK, we were, we, we have expanded and so we, we have adequate staff to inspect both for the health and safety requirements, which the public health sanitarians conduct those inspections and um, the educational consultant inspections, which are for regarding uh, qualifications and, and clearances. Well, so we, hear, we hear reports uh, of rising workloads for the ECECs and very high attrition rates. Uh, which makes me concerned that we're not getting to every child care facility uh, in time, but you can assure us that's not the case? We are, uh, we are reaching all of those child care sites, and in fact, we have, uh, we're just increasing the ECEC staff um, to be able to make sure that we reach that target. Okay. Well, I am pleased that we have been joined by my predecessor as chair, of the Health Committee, who's left me impossibly big shoes to fill, and uh, obviously our speaker, Corey Johnson. I'm going to pass it over to him. I, I only wanted to come by because I was leaving the other hearing, and I saw that uh, this hearing was going on to tell you that you're in very good hands, as you know already, with Chair Levine. And I have a really a soft spot in my heart for, of course, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the critical work that you all do every day and Dr. Bassett, it was uh, wonderful to work with you as health chair, and we're going to continue to work together. Uh, but, um, you know, Chair Levine, I think, is the perfect person to succeed me on the critical work that the health department does. And the council, I think, in the past, uh, when I was chair, but also not just amongst me, but other members, really tried to champion public health measures that mattered. and and pushed for more dollars when sometimes you weren't able to fully say you needed more dollars. We were the ones banging the drums uh, for more dollars. And I know that uh, Chair Levine, um, we had a great event at the Chelsea STD Clinic the other day, which he came to. And I just wanted to come by and say that I still, of course, support the mission and work uh, that you all do every single day. Uh, but also, you are in great hands with Mark, um, who uh, has been dedicated to these issues for years, and, and he and I are going to work together on ways to continue to ensure that the best public health department in the United States of America gets the support that it needs. So I have no questions, just a statement of affection and support uh, for both you and for Chair Levine. So I wanted to come by when I walked by the door and heard that mellifluous voice testifying. Uh, I wanted to come by. So good to see you, Mary. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Much appreciated. Thank you for letting and me interrupt to provide my support and affection, Chair Levine. <laughs> you see how nice we are in the City Council? Uh, um, so uh, I did want... Th 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 thank you. I'm I know getting you the hell out of here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. But if, I did want to say that, uh, make sure that you're aware of something that we started um, in, in my tenure in environmental health. Uh, uh, child care program is a um, is a, a, a more focused attention on low performing centers uh, where, so that we identify places where they uh, they are not closed we very rarely have to close a child's care site but they are sort of uh, 
low performing on more than one inspection, to put them into a kind of performance improvement track, to work directly with them, to try to make sure that they don't just pass, but they are the kind of center that we would all want to send our kids to. All right. Um, I'm going to, I want to close on, on a topic I alluded to earlier on, which is um, the imperative that we find a way to connect undocumented New Yorkers to healthcare services. We have, um, thankfully, uh, a comprehensive program in Child Health Plus, uh, which is reaching most undocumented kids. So we talk, when I talk about this challenge, I'm referring to adults, uh, but the numbers there are still uh, quite significant, estimated to be 300,000 undocumented adults in the five boroughs who are not eligible for any of the healthcare, uh, insu health insurance programs that we've been speaking about. Um, we had a groundbreaking pilot here over the last year or two called Action Health, uh, which connected over 1,000 undocumented New Yorkers to primary care services, and um, it's been evaluated. And uh, I would like to know whether you consider that program to have been a success. And if so, then um, will we continue it? Thank you for that question. Uh, and as you know, uh, we are very concerned about the uh, access to care for the undocumented. Uh, we want everyone to know that almost all children are entitled to be covered, including undocumented children under Child Care Plus, uh, Child Health Plus, uh, and that's part of the educational outreach. Uh, the Action Health uh, NYC program that you allude to was concluded in June of 2017 uh, at the end of the last of, of the last fiscal year and uh, we have made the report available to you uh, as you know we were able to recruit um, I, I believe it was 1300 people who received the full action health um, uh, service which uh, in return for committing to get their care at one of seven, nine primary care sites around the city, uh, they uh, got uh, case management and uh, an enhanced continuity of care, and their referral care to uh, specialty care was in the health and hospital system. So uh, we, uh, co we compared that to people who got usual care. And it was promising, and we shared those findings with not just you, but with the health and hospitals um, which is the, the uh, health care system in our city that we're so lucky to have that provides care to everybody who walks in the door regardless of their status or their ability to pay. Uh, so I'm sh I expect that they will take this experience under advisement and uh, continue to work on it. Uh, as you know, the current... They, they being the public hospitals? Yes, the public hospitals. But system. the health department could fund this program in the future, no? The, uh, the program came to an end. It was funded, um, as you're aware, by philanthropic dollars, and it ended in June of 2017. Uh, it's the lessons from this program that I think will guide the renewed commitment to primary care and the health and hospitals. But g given the success and understanding it was private dollars and therefore limited, uh, is the city considering a public investment and expanding and... and making permanent such services? The city has shown an enormous commitment to the public hospital system, which remains the main resource for New Yorkers who need care, uh, who can get that care regardless of their documentation status or their ability to pay. Well, I, I, I am grateful that we live in a city where anyone can go into an emergency room and, and receive medical care. But uh, as you know, um, primary care is an incredibly powerful vehicle for preventing disease, for managing disease, um, and it, it really yields uh, tremendous health benefits uh, and also, again, financial benefits because it's much cheaper to address a condition early or even to prevent before the onset uh, in the setting of a primary care facility than it is to treat someone who's coming in uh, to an emergency room, which is where people land than no alternative. So, um, so I believe it's essential that we find a way to connect every single New Yorker 
I don't care what their documentation status is, to primary care services um, for their benefit and for the financial benefit of the broader health system. So. I, I'm sure that you're aware that the new president and CEO of Health and Hospitals, Mitch Katz, is, is, uh, has see, expressed he, he a agrees, clear commitment. He agrees. He agrees. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we're going to close out our section of the hearing today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Dr. Bassett. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So we're going to ask uh, the Chief Medical Examiner uh, to join us. Well, there were a lot of questions I couldn't answer. <laughs> Okay, welcome, Dr. Sampson. Thank you. Excited for round two of our hearing, uh, in which we will be reviewing the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner and the $78 million fiscal 2019 operating budget. We'll also be addressing the office's performance indicators from the fiscal 18 preliminary mayor's management report and the $55 million in OCME capital projects in the fiscal 2019 preliminary capital budget and commitment plan for fiscal 2018 to 2022. Um, the work of, of your office is uh, largely unseen by New Yorkers um, and, and probably unappreciated or underappreciated. Uh, I suppose TV shows like CSI have uh, perhaps partially remedied that, but the truth is that your work really is essential to maintaining public health in this city, and also it's a pillar of the criminal justice system. And your mandate has really grown uh, in recent years with um, expansive, the expansion of the use of DNA testing, uh, with uh, the rise of the opioid crisis, and also in the post-9-11 era, uh, the degree to which we have to prepare for uh, mass death events. It's um, no longer a hypothetical in this city, so um, you are certainly doing more than ever before, um, and we're looking to dive into that work and the question of whether you have adequate resources for that. Um, among other topics, we're going to be looking um, uh, in the hearing about uh, lead time that you uh, are taking um, for completion of DNA cases um, for various types of crimes. Uh, the lead time today, I believe, stands at 39 days for homicide cases, at 41 days uh, for sexual assault cases, 
and uh, a whopping 164 cases for property crimes. Uh, I believe that we can and should do better to reduce lead time in all those categories, uh, understanding that we particularly have to pri prioritize violent crimes, um, homicide and sexual assault, but that even property crimes need to be taken seriously. Similarly, we'll examine the lead time required for scene arrivals from medical legal investigators, MLIs. Uh, I believe that time stands at 1.7 hours. Uh, in the first four months of fiscal year 2018. Uh, a delay that may in part be due to understaffing in the MLI uh, position. We'll give you a chance to address that. Uh, retention rates, I believe, for MLIs appear to be low, uh, which I think it may be part of an office-wide challenge faced by other titles as well. Um, and finally, uh, although in the fiscal 2019 preliminary capital budget and capital plan, um, there is new funding included for OCME and capital projects. Um, uh, I look forward to receiving an update on those projects and whether the funding is adequate to address the needs of, of what I can say based on uh, firsthand view, um, significant outdated facilities that you have, some of which date to the 1950s. Uh, I want to thank, as always, my great committee staff and Jeanette Merrill. Crystal Pond and Zay Emanuel Halu for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Um, and I'm pleased that we um, remain in the presence of committee member Keith Powers. And uh, I'm now going to turn it over to our committee counsel to administer the affirmation to the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay, uh, Chief, take it away. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Levine uh, and uh, member of the Health Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, we at the Office of Chief Med Medical Examiner value your leadership and thank the City Council for its support uh, in our mission to serve the people of New York City during their times of profound need. I am Dr. Barbara Sampson, the Chief Medical Examiner, and my duty is to protect the public health and to serve criminal justice through forensic science. My personal mission is to build our medical examiner's office into the ideal forensic institution, independent, unbiased, immune from undue influence, and as accurate as humanly possible. Seated with me are Dina Maniotis, Executive Deputy Commissioner for Administration, and Florence Hutner, my General Counsel. I start my fifth year as the appointed chief of the strongest and most comprehensive medical examiner office in the country. Together, we celebrate with all New York City the centennial of this office, which is the home of the first US forensic toxicology laboratory. Let me begin with the tremendous accomplishments of our toxicology laboratory. That lab has, in the last two years, undergone an expansive reorganization and strengthening through staff, staff training and the acquisition of advanced analytical instrumentation. The result is that a backlog of more than 800 cases was eliminated in less than three months in 2016, and turnaround times for completion of casework have been drastically reduced from an average of 120 days to 20 days or less with over 90% of all cases completed within 30 days. This is twice as fast as the national standard. Further, the Tox Lab maintained both New York State and the American Board of Forensic Toxicology Accreditation, expanded the scope of its testing, and developed new testing methods to address the changing needs of a modern forensic toxicology laboratory. All of this was achieved during a particularly challenging time, the ongoing nationwide opioid epidemic. The OCME investigates all deaths which may in any way involve drug intoxication, and we perform autopsies and forensic toxicology testing to determine the cause and manner of death of these individuals. The New York City medical examiners play a central role in helping to characterize the opioid epidemic, serving as a critical source of data regarding which drugs and which drug combinations are causing these deaths and which populations may be at greatest risk for fatal overdoses. As part of Healing NYC, the Mayor and First Lady's plan to disrupt the opioid epidemic in New York City, the OCME routinely sits at the table with law enforcement, 
and public health partners across all levels of government to analyze this epidemic and formulate strategies to combat its impact. As part of these investments made through Healing NYC, the lab introduced a new method capable for, of screening 30 different synthetic opioids, an essential tool to meet the challenge of the opioid epidemic, which is fueled by illicit fentanyl. The in-house tools allow OCME to share its findings with our partner agencies in real time at an unprecedented level of detail, helping inform decisions made by DOH, MH, and law enforcement. Our lab continues to develop advanced methodologies to identify emerging illicit drugs, including not only synthetic opioids, but also other novel psychoactive substances. These designer drugs are increasing in prevalence and the laboratory will continue to ensure it is equipped to deal with constant changes in drugs available on the street and to support the medical examiners in determining cause and manner of death. The toxicology lab also has the technical expertise and advanced laboratory instrumentation to provide the City of New York with a centralized forensic toxicology service. In September 2017, with the support of the New York City District Attorney's offices and the NYPD, the OCME Forensic Toxicology Laboratory was approved to test all specimens collected in New York City from individuals suspected of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Previously, some of those tests were performed by the NYPD lab or by a private laboratory. Having a centralized service at OCME to perform this work saves on substantial costs associated with having tests carried out by private labs and from bringing those experts from out of state to testify in New York City. In addition, all DUI cases will be tested for both alcohol and drugs. Further, our laboratory, with significant investment over the past two years in staff training, now has the greatest number of New York State certified analysts for alcohol testing anywhere in the country. We have the capacity to provide expert witness testimony across all five boroughs of the city. Through new funding, two staff are being onboarded to support the additional casework received in DUI, for DUI testing. These include a criminalist who will carry out the laboratory duties and a laboratory inventory manager who will manage the consumables required to deliver this service, return completed evidence to NYPD, and provide additional laboratory support duties. Since 2017, we have seen a three-fold increase in the number of DUI cases submitted for testing, but nevertheless have continued to maintain turnaround times of less than 20 days. The increase has not impacted our ability to complete cases submitted by medical examiners or cases submitted for testing for suspected drug-facilitated ass sexual assaults. At the end of 2017, mean turnaround times were 17 and 18 days, respectively, for these cases. In addition to the American Board of Forensic Toxicology accredited tox lab, OCME is also the home of two other highly advanced accredited labs, the Forensic Biology Lab and Molecular Genetics. So now I will turn to the Forensic Biology Lab. The OCME operates North America's largest public forensic DNA laboratory and is a leader in DNA technology and research. Forensic biology also processes environmentally challenged and degraded skeletal remains utilizing optimized bone extraction techniques. We are also continuing to work on the unidentified remains of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This August, we identified the 1,641st person from the attack on September 11th. We honored the wishes of that family to withhold the name of the person identified. The identification of this victim was performed by our laboratory using new technologies developed in-house and placed <laughs> online in 2017. This year, we have also reassociated many remains to previously identified victims. As we promised the impacted families in 2001, we are continuing our work on the identification of the victims of this disaster. Since 2015, the Forensic Biology Lab has experienced a record increase in case submissions all while maintaining an excellent turnaround time of approximately six weeks for crimes against persons. In calendar year 2016, the laboratory experienced a profound 46% increase in cases over 2015. The increased case submissions are continuing. Most of this increase is due to the processing of gun crimes resulting from the successful Merrill initiative called Project Fast Track. Forensic Biology added new needs funding in July 2017 and increased capacity to hire 53 staff to address case submission increases. 
of which 35 are forensic molecular biologists and 18 are operations staff. We have been successful in our effort to recruit, onboard, and begin intensive training of these staff. Additionally, we have been successful in training and promoting our very capable current employees into positions of greater responsibility and complexity. In January 2018, the fourth refinement of our production system using efficiency practices of Lean and Six Sigma was implemented to essentially do more with less, process more cases than can be achieved by new hires alone. Initial results are very promising. Our goal is to continue to reduce our backlog and turnaround times, even with a dramatic increase in cases. Our preeminent molecular genetics laboratory directly supports our mandate to investigate sudden, unexpected, and unexplained deaths in apparently healthy New York City residents. Advances in molecular medicine have increased the ability to identify diseases at the molecular level that escape discovery after complete autopsy, microscopic examination, and toxicology testing. Currently, the lab performs molecular analysis of 95 cardiomyopathy genes, those are diseases of the heart, thrombophilia molecular testing, those are diseases that cause clotting, and sickle cell disease. The 95 cardiac gene test panel has nearly tripled the success rate of the six gene panel it replaced. The Molecular Genetics Laboratory received its third consecutive zero deficiency, which means a perfect score, during its College of American Pathologists biennial announced on, unannounced on-site inspection. Since 2016, we have also been providing professional genetic counseling services and support to families of the decedents who test positive by our laboratory. Finally, two articles on molecular diagnostics in idiopathic pulmonary embolisms and sudden unexplained deaths have been accepted for publication in highly respected peer review journals. In 2015, at my direction, the agency conducted an in-depth analysis of the mortuary unit's operations, which resulted in a series of corrective actions to meet an ambitious standard of 100% accuracy 100% of the time. The City Council funded OCME and FY16 with additional mortuary staff and since then, I am proud to say we have built a truly outstanding cadre of forensic quality specialists who work tirelessly to ensure the highest quality control in mortuary operations. Even with added controls that are by their nature time consuming, we have maintained excellent processing times for our stakeholders. In 2017, funeral directors waited only 31 minutes on average to pick up a decedent. Overall, in 2017 and across the boroughs, OCME made remains available or ready to release for burial in 1.7 days. Remains are picked up by funeral directors on average about eight days from when they are ready to release. I want to turn now to the preliminary budget. The New York City OCME has approximately 740 employees and an operating budget of $78.4 million of which 76.4 million is city tax levy. In this preliminary budget, we received 20 new positions to augment our mortuary operations and run two additional medical examiner transport teams 24 seven and 365 days a year. The Tox Lab received two additional staff and $86,000 in OTPS to conduct all DWI testing for all New York City cases prosecuted by the DAs in all five boroughs. In conclusion, I want to express my gratitude to the city, this administration, and this city council for valuing and supporting OCME in science serving justice. I would also like to publicly thank the family members with whom our staff interacts each day. As I end my 20th year as a New York City medical examiner, I can speak for all OCME staff when I say that providing answers and a little bit of comfort to grieving families is the greatest reward of our job. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Chief. And I do want to acknowledge that the scientists in your office and many of the other professionals could make a lot more money elsewhere and that they have chosen uh, to work with OCME because they believe in the mission and, and we're grateful for that. Um, uh, I do want to address the, the question of lead time and the errors that I identified earlier. Excuse me, I also want to pause and acknowledge we've been joined by fellow committee member, Anaz Barron. Thank you. Um, so did I have my numbers right on lead times for DNA tests for the various crimes? 
They're, they're called turnaround times, yes. Turnaround times. Average time. turnaround times. Okay, yes, so it's 39 days for homicide, 41 days for sexual assault, 164 days for property crime. That's correct. Is that <laughs> right? And how does that compare to prior years, those, those turnaround they're, times? They're uh, higher than they were the last few years because of the increased number of case submissions. As you alluded to, we have prioritized crimes against people. So our turnaround time for homicide cases and for sexual assault cases is low. We have no backlog at all in any of those cases. And we work very closely with the uh, police and the district attorney's office. So when there is a, uh, a case that they feel they is a public, uh, imminent public safety issue, we work with them and are able to rush those cases so that the um, cases can be completed within a few days. Uh, so otherwise, uh, the, the cases that we have been forced to deprioritize are those that are involve property crimes, um, but the, um, uh, we've taken a number of steps to begin to address that backlog in particular. Right, this is just, it's so important because uh, as investigations drag on, it becomes more difficult to apprehend a suspect, as you well know, and because it's, if, if someone who has committed a homicide is that large, uh, identifying that person is of utmost importance. And the same is true for someone who commits sexual assault or uh, to a lesser degree, but not, it's not trivial, someone who commits a property crime. Um, Am I to understand that you said in a priority case you can turn around one of these tests in a matter of days? It, uh, depending on how complex the testing is, uh, we can do it sometimes within 24, 36 hours. Sometimes it's more, a little bit more complicated, so it takes several days, yes. Right, so it's, it's, you're not like growing something in a Petri dish that <laughs> has to sit on the shelf right. for several weeks, right? So where there are the resources, you can do this in many, if not most cases, in a matter of days. Is that correct? Uh, in a, a particular case when we prioritize that over uh, other casework. Obviously, if we prioritize one case or a few cases, then other cases don't get done, um, which increases then the turnaround time for the other cases. Right, but it's, th there's not an ongoing test underway for these 39 days. There's essentially the kit, if that's the term, is sitting on a shelf somewhere, well, correct? They're, 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 let, me, let me correct uh, myself a little bit. It's, uh, that is a few days to the uh, generation of information that is useful for the police, and we share that with them in these kinds of cases very quickly. There are other steps after the completion of the testing that must go on, quality assurance steps, writing the lab report itself, having senior uh, uh, criminalists review those lab reports. Uh, these are all parts of our accreditation. So the uh, final report is not ready within, you know, 24 hours. But, but that can't be more than a few days. Oh, no, I, that actually QA. takes quite a while because the, uh, the, the number of people who can do that kind of work, the most senior uh, criminalists, um, uh, it, it, it takes time for them. They're, they have such a great number of cases, it takes time for them to get through them. Right, but in these expedited cases, um, where the testing period lasts several days, when is the final report done and those that you're expediting? They, uh, once we give the information to the uh, police, the final report is not, um, it, it, it's, uh, not as critically important, but it's probably, I don't know um, off, but, uh, off the top of my head, but you're right, it's not very long after that. Right. Got it, so how many staff are currently in the DNA testing uh, division? About uh, yeah, approximately 160. Okay, um, is it not simple math that if we increased your head count there, we could turn around these tests more quickly? I, yeah, so we have increased our head count by 53. We were given uh, 53 additional head count last year. But remember that to onboard a scientist is a, a long process. We have identified uh, all the scientists uh, of those 53. Uh, I think it was about 49, uh, yeah, 48 total. Uh, 48 total. Uh, they are in their training process. So we have to, uh, before they can do any testing, they have to go through training in our laboratory as required by the FBI, the FBI set standards for this. So that training takes at least six months, depending on the level, it can take up to a year. So these scientists now are going through that training. 
uh, and will join uh, as quickly as possible the actual uh, lab work. But that takes time. We do have a, th that's why in addition to onboarding new staff, we've also had a plan to reorganize the laboratory to increase that efficiency. So with the plan that we just started, now we are able to address the backlog uh, as well. Okay. And we, okay. uh, we anticipate that the backlog in property crime uh, once everything is, uh, um, uh, all the scientists are, are uh, in the laboratory, we can uh, whittle down over a matter of about uh, 30 months. So we do have a plan to address the, the, the entire laboratory. All right. I, I just want to pause and acknowledge we've been joined by the famous red shirts of AARP. <laughs> uh, we're glad you're here and hoping we'll get to hear testimony from you in our public session. Um, so you're about to onboard this new cohort. At that point, um, what can we expect lead times to drop to? The, uh, our target is uh, 30 days. That's a very uh, ambitious target, but we've set that purpose. For all categories of crime? Uh, ultimately, yes, that's our, our goal is, is 30 days. Got it. Uh, we're going to be monitoring this closely. Uh, this is work that we need to invest in, um, criminal justice process depends on it, and we'd appreciate it if you would keep us updated on this important balance between the staffing resources and the lead time in this category. Uh, as for the time it takes to retrieve um, a deceased person, uh, a job that you uh, rely on the medical, medical legal uh, investigators for, MLIs, uh, am I correct that the lead time is is uh, 1.7 hours currently? Uh, 1.7 hours for our arrival at the scene, yes. So this isn't like an ambulance which has to get there in minutes to save someone who is still living. I don't want to overstate this, but uh, there are also a lot of reasons why you don't want um, a body uh, sitting around without retrieval. There may even be uh, scientific reasons why you want to retrieve the body quickly. I, I don't know about that, but there certainly is a public interest in quick retrieval. So how many MLIs do you currently have on the job? We currently have 27 MLIs on staff and five uh, positions added in the new needs. Got it. Uh, but you have those, 20 those, those, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, those five remain uh, vacant. Those five remain. Yeah, so we have 27 on staff. Right. And we got five uh, positions added, uh, but those remain vacant. Because? Because of the difficulties in recruiting uh, medical legal investigators. They are trained physician's assistants, and the market for physician's assistants is extremely competitive. Yes, this, this is, a, 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 this is a, a high stakes job. This is. Uh, more than just uh, transporting an inanimate object. This is uh, dealing with bodies, and so we expect them to be highly trained. Um, so are we underpaying them? Why are we having trouble recruiting? Uh, it's, there's just uh, two, the, the physician's assistants are v very popular um, in the medical field. There's just too many competing uh, 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 jobs in hospitals and uh, other positions, and are, making our position less attractive. Are you, are you therefore confident that, um, are we retaining those, those positions that are currently filled, or are we also facing retention problems? Uh, our retention um, uh, percent attrition yes. in FY17 was 15%. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's above or below what you're targeting, but uh, it's certainly worrisome that you have unfilled positions. Uh, for a critical function, how low could, how much would the lead time drop if you had all your positions filled? Uh, the, uh, let me um, address the arrival time. So that arrival time of 1.7 hours includes all cases where we go to the scene. So there are some cases where we purposely delay our arrival at the scene. A good example is in a suspected homicide. We have to coordinate our arrival of our investigator with the crime scene detectives at the, the, that are also responding to the scene. Uh, so uh, and they often have to do part of their work first before we can uh, do our part of the work. So that's incorporated into that 1.7 hours. Another example of where we purposely delay our arrival at the scene would be in a, uh, if a person dies an apparently natural death and we are communicating, attempting to communicate with the person's physician to establish whether OCME even needs to take jurisdiction. That can also 
we purposely delay uh, the scene for that uh, reason. What we're most interested in when we discuss uh, the arrival times are those cases where uh, a body is in public view. Right. So, for example, you know, somebody uh, tragically hit by a car in the street. Those kinds of cases uh, we look at uh, separately, and uh, th those uh, arrivals are shorter than that 1.7. What is the average arrival time for uh, a public for what we, We've been tracking closely, of, uh, for example, subway uh, uh, incidents, and those have been the, the arrival time about a half an hour uh, on average since we've been tracking it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to uh, observe that we had a death in the subway system this Tragic morning at 4 a.m. Uh, track worker, which is just horrible. Yes. Um, and I assume your office would, would be involved in such a case. Yes, we is were involved, correct? absolutely. Okay. Um, we don't negotiate labor contracts in city council hearings, but it sure seems to me we got to pay the MLIs better to uh, attract the talent that we need so that we fully staff this function. Uh, I'm going to pause and turn to my colleague, Councilmember Powers, who I believe has a question. Thank you, and thank you for being here. And you're, you're not in my district, but you're, you're very close, and I walk past your building <laughs> on, I think, 20 or 26th Street, is yes. that right? Uh, often. I, I, it actually, just a quick aside before I ask my other questions, are, are you, what is the long-term plan to stay in that building or on uh, 26th Street? Uh, so uh, we have two buildings right in that area. Yeah, the building yeah. on 20 Stick Street is a beautiful, uh, d our DNA lab, administrative offices, right, right, right. and we plan to stay there forever. And then the Good. other building that you might this be referring is old, to is the yeah, 521st yeah, yeah. Avenue on 30th Street. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, right. So and our plans for that, as uh, uh, Council Member uh, Chair Levine uh, alluded to, it's an old building, um, over 50 years old, uh, definitely in need of replacement. Uh, and we are working very closely with EDC and OMB to establish a place uh, for the new building. And I'll be glad to update you as soon as we have more information about that. But it's going well, the, the planning stage. Just asking. It's, yep. my, it's, my, it's, a, it's it. on my commute. So <laughs> I, um, the, I, I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. And we've gotten some inquiries related to Hearts Island. Uh, which I believe is the island where uh, the uh, people are buried if they're unclaimed uh, by a family member or, uh, or close, you know, close person. Um, can you just give us more information about the relationship between your agency and Department of Corrections related to Hearts Island? Certainly, right. So the um, uh, people who uh, uh, go to City Cemetery are exactly as you described, either people who are unclaimed or whose families have chosen them to go there, or they are unidentified. Mm -hmm. uh, our role is uh, we do a complete uh, uh, process to try to identify each and every person um, before uh, they are uh, sent to city burial. So just to give, put it in perspective, there, uh, we handle about 10,000 decedents every year. Uh, about 1,000 of those on average go to uh, city burial. Uh, this last year in 2017, only 23 of those were uh, unidentified. So we, you can imagine the challenge of identifying uh, someone where you really have um, not much to go on. Um, so we uh, have a very extensive process uh, to do this. Uh, before any individual is transported to City Cemetery, uh, the outreach unit conducts extensive investigation to identify next of kin. They go, if the person came from a healthcare facility, we reach out to the healthcare facility to see if there is any next of kin. And we also uh, determine if there's any plans for final disposition of the decedent. Um, we contact um, the public administrator in the relevant borough, as well as two New York City organizations that hold information about prepaid uh, funeral plans. Uh, the outreach unit also conducts an internet uh, investigation, including sites such as the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System called NamUs uh, and HHS databases. Uh, if a decedent is determined to be a veteran without known or interested next of kin, the case is referred to the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, which investigates the subject's military service. If the decedent is eligible for military burial, uh, uh, DVA makes those arrangements. Uh, when a veteran, uh, when veteran eligibility cannot be determined, uh, then the remains may be buried on Hart Island. But we also work with other agencies, Department of Homeless Services, and various consulates if we suspect that someone is a foreign national, 
And then beyond that, we can also work with NYPD to uh, conduct searches of uh, missing persons databases uh, maintained by law enforcement agencies and, um, uh, rest and uh, Department of Motor Vehicle Records and all of that. So after we exhaust all of that and decide that someone uh, is going to a uh, city burial, uh, our role is to um, prepare the uh, person uh, for city burial and transport them um, uh, via one of our uh, medical examiner transport trucks uh, to the dock uh, on uh, that uh, w w serves the ferry that goes to uh, um, uh, Hard Island. So our responsibility is simply that transport and then handing it off to uh, Department of Corrections. Wow, it's an extensive uh, process. I have to, I have to, I have to admit it's that it's a daunting you build, process. Yeah. yeah, and um, and and the I guess that this is you know you hand off to Department of Corrections, but some of the concerns we've heard is also just inaccessibility to people who want to go to Hearts Island. I'm just wondering if you've heard any concerns either about the the existence of it or or the operations of it or just the 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 ability to go there if one desires nothing that. more than what uh, I read in the press got it yep. okay thank you uh, thank you council member thank you for bringing up Hart Island and for people who don't know the context here this is 120 acres and it's in the Long Island Sound uh, there's a, two centuries of history there it used to be um, a place where people with uh, substance abuse problems and other, or, or communicable diseases were sent for isolation there's a Cold War era missile silos there, but most importantly, it's the resting place of one million New Yorkers. And it's currently managed by the Department of Corrections, which is how it's landed on, on Councilmember Powers' radar screen, uh, which just makes no sense. Uh, it's turned the island into a secure facility. You can't go there without an armed escort. Uh, there's essentially no public access except for a very, very narrow window for people who have loved ones buried there, which they have to go accompanied by an armed guard. Not exactly a way to have an emotional uh, connection to a loved one who might be buried there. Um, this island really should be open to the public uh, because of its historical importance, because of uh, just the beauty and the history of the setting, and, um, and most importantly so that loved ones can, uh, like you would hope in any cemetery, connect to deceased family members uh, in the most peaceful, respectful way. Uh, so I have called for uh, transfer of management of the island to the Parks Department and transfer of the burial function uh, to the OCME. Um, uh, this has been a long-standing push, which uh, I feel very strongly about, and I think that my colleagues do as well. Uh, I don't expect you to, to solve this in this hearing, but it's, it's an issue that uh, we plan to continue to push on. Do, do you have any, any statements on the appropriateness of, of such a vision? My um, concern is that the OCME is a science and medical institution. That, that is our area of expertise. We really have no specialized expertise at all in managing a cemetery, interring people. It, it really is beyond the scope of you know, anything we've ever thought about doing or our mission as it stands. I, I understand, but if it's a stretch for you, it's downright ridiculous for the Department of Corrections to have expertise in such matters. Uh, so uh, we, we'll, we'll be continuing to, to push on that front. Um, I do want to ask you about um, some of the work that you're doing beyond the confines of New York City, and uh, you, you, you mentioned the 100-year uh, history of the office, and uh, I think at the time that, that we, felt we formed this office in New York City, it was way ahead of any other jurisdiction in America, and that it, we're still way ahead of any other jurisdiction in America, and therefore we are doing some work beyond the five boroughs. Could you explain what that is? Sure. Uh, I think what you're referring to, uh, well, we serve as experts uh, whenever other jurisdictions uh, require expertise in areas that we um, particularly excel. And unfortunately, one of the areas in which we have really excelled is in the management of mass fatality events. Uh, from our response to September 11th, uh, to the Flight 587 that crashed just a couple months later, the anthrax attack, 
uh, all occurring within a few months of each other in 2001, um, we became the unwilling experts uh, nationwide. And I can tell you today that OCME, New York City, is um, prepared better than any other city in the United States for uh, a tragic event, um, like, for example, this school shooting uh, that occurred recently, and again today, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> in accordance with SIMS, uh, OCME is responsible for managing all of this, any incident that occurs in New York City uh, with uh, fatalities. Uh, we have to investigate, we have to recover the decedents from the scene, we need uh, post-mortem examination of every case, and collection of information from families to facilitate the identification process. So this is a very complex response uh, that we have. We can uh, certainly describe it in great detail, but what I think you were referring to is our uh, UVIS uh, uh, um, uh, system, which is the Unified Victim Identification System. Um, and that is a system that we developed with Homeland Security money, and it helps the uh, collection of anti-mortem information from families and then uh, matching up that anti-mortem information with post-mortem uh, information that the medical examiners and anthropologists are getting uh, after the um, uh, 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 processing uh, of the remains. This is a system uh, that will greatly facilitate identifications. Uh, New Jersey, for, and many jurisdictions around the country are using our system, including New Jersey, which is uh, an advantage um, since an, any attack here um, would uh, affect the whole tri-state area. Uh, in particular, most recently, UVIS was uh, activated in um, Las Vegas for the Las Vegas shooting. Uh, the, we have a long uh, and wonderful relationship with Clark County in uh, Las Vegas. We have trained with them. And in fact, during the shooting, th uh, after the shooting, when they set up the uh, unified victim identification uh, system there, three of our experts went out there to, uh, to assist. Three so of them, you said? What, how, many, how many did we send? Three. Three? All right, three. well, that's, it's, it's great that we're able to do that. Um, yeah, we always stand ready to assist because these expertise are, are very, very important um, when they're needed. So as I mentioned earlier, the opioid epidemic has unfortunately um, uh, really expanded the workload of your office. Uh, toxicology testing is very important in such cases, and one reason because it's often fentanyl, uh, fentanyl, sorry, that uh, is the cause of death. So it's not, it's not explicitly the opioid, but we have a problem with uh, fentanyl being um, mixed in. Uh, and so last year, I believe your office got uh, another million or two to expand your capacity for fentanyl testing. Could you report on that and uh, whether you're currently now uh, adequately resourced for those yes. uh, functions? Uh, yeah, so as um, part of the investments made through Healing NYC, the lab introduced a new method of screening for not only fentanyl, but 30 synthetic uh, opioids. So uh, these are fentanyls that have been doctored up uh, to uh, be uh, uh, different kinds of drugs. And it, this and this drug scene is always changing. So our toxicology lab has to stay on top of all of this uh, and develop new testing as uh, drugs change and what, on what the And what are some examples of, of synthetic opioids? Would we know? Uh, are, are they, they have complex chemical names. Um, they, and how prevalent is this? Uh, how prevalent me? is that in the, in the supply of opioids? It's becoming more and more prevalent. You know, we see fentanyl, but then we also see these other uh, basically analogs of fentanyl that have just been chemically modified a little bit. So these are not plant-based and they're, they're created in labs? And they're created in labs. Including right. potentially in the five boroughs. Uh, there's illicit workshops that are creating the synthetic opioids? This is not my area of expertise, but my belief is that most of these, these drugs are coming from abroad, not from home. Can you trace the origin based on the chemical markings? That's, that's a very interesting question, and we have had several cases now where exactly that has been very important, and we work with the district attorneys or U.S. attorneys who are investigating that to help you know, draw the line between uh, how these uh, drugs got into New York. Got it. It's almost like tracing... Illegal guns, you can determine if they were bought 
in, from a, a rogue dealer in Virginia, you can go after the source. So that, maybe exactly. it's the same. Right. And I just, I have to, again, congratulate my toxicology lab. They have done outstanding work. And I tell you, without doubt, that they are performing testing at, at absolutely on the cutting edge, equivalent to uh, and exceeding any lab, including uh, private labs uh, in the United States. Um, so unfortunately, every single city agency gets uh, some money from the federal government. I say unfortunately because that's vulnerable in the era of a very hostile administration, particularly uh, an administration which is hostile to public health interests. Does your office receive uh, federal funding? Yes, we do. What, what is that? How much is it? So um, uh, in particular, we receive about $3 million in uh, federal uh, grant funding for uh, DNA work. Uh, about a million, uh, uh, well, a million from, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, that pays for criminalists, overtime, supplies, education, and also federal research uh, grants that uh, help d keep us on the cutting edge as a DNA laboratory, developing next generation sequencing, proteomics research, and those sorts of things. Um, and then in addition to that, we also get grants from NIJ, uh, National Institute of Justice, and the Urban Area Security Initiative um, in the, to the tune of about a million dollars uh, as well to support uh, ongoing um, training uh, and staff to support a, a mass fatality response. Well, I, I know the Trump administration has made the, the, the uh, indefensible threat of cutting health research funding. I'm not sure to the extent to which that has affected you, but do you have reason to believe that any of your federal streams are currently at risk? We have no reason to believe that at this time. Okay, well, we, we hope that will continue to be the case and, and we will monitor it uh, closely. I just have one final follow-up question on the capital needs that Councilmember Powers raised. So you mentioned that you're looking for a new site for your new building. So you're not intending to rebuild at the current location. And I'm wondering then, um, are you looking to be nearby? Do you need to be in Manhattan? Or could this be anywhere? Well, uh, we already have a facility in Queens and in Brooklyn. I think it is important to have a facility in Manhattan because of the the uh, high, you know, uh, um, the chances of something uh, untoward happening in Manhattan, having a mor uh, mortuary ready to roll quickly uh, close by, I think would be an advantage. Also, as you know, our DNA building is on 26th Street, and I think it's uh, to everyone's advantage to be in close proximity uh, to each other, to be absolutely the most efficient that we can be sharing information and expertise. Um, so that would be our preference. So is it fair to say you're looking for a site within several blocks of your current location? That would be our preference, um, but we are working closely with uh, EDC to try to uh, establish a, a, a and that, But that has not been established yet. It, you don't have a location yet. Correct. We're still working on that. Okay. Well, we'll be anxious to hear. Uh, it may wind up in your district, council <laughs> member, depending on what side of the street. It may have a location for you now that, uh, we're talking, now that you bring it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Chief, for your testimony and for the, the great service of your office. Thank you so we much. We appreciate it. We're now going to move to our public session. So I'm going to call our first panel, um, which will be Terry Wilder from New York Medical Examiner Action. Do I have that right? Yeah. OK. Uh, we have. Stephanie Ruiz from Live On New York. We have Erica Lessem from the Treatment Action Group. And we have Anthony Feliciano from the Commission on the Public Health System. So, um, I'm going to ask the, the sergeant to put a two-minute timer on. We unfortunately have, not unfortunate, it's great. We have a lot of people who want to testify in the public, and we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard. So, um, Terry, would you like to kick us off? Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm Terry Wilder. I'm actually with New York Emmy Action. New York. New York Emmy Action. Which is what? Uh, so we're a group that was just formed last year to address um, New Yorkers living with myalgic encephalitis, which is a mouthful. I thought uh, it was medical examiner. No. But you'll, you'll have to explain. Uh... 
yeah. what you're working on. Yes. Um, so ME, CFS is usually what people refer to this as. There's an estimated between 800,000 and 2.5 million living with this disease in the United States, and we estimate between 52,000 and 152,000 in New York State. Um, it's estimated that about 84 to 91% of people have not even been diagnosed with this disease. It affects more women than men. Uh, main areas of impairment are reduction in the ability to carry out normal daily activities. Um, there were supposed to be other people with me here today, um, but they could not make it because they're too sick. Um, I was diagnosed with this disease in uh, March of 2016 after being very, very sick for several years. I'm here today because there is one medical provider in New York City who's an expert on this disease and takes uh, private health insurance. Um, there are zero dollars in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene budget. Um, this is a problem because medical providers are unaware of this disease. It is often undiagnosed and misdiagnosed. The cause of ME is unknown. There is no cure for it. And the majority of patients never really regain their pre-disease quality of life. It's in many reports, it is said that people's quality of life is worse than most chronic diseases, including heart disease and other conditions. At least one quarter of people with this disease are bed bound or home bound. I am one of the lucky ones. I'm on kind of the healthier spectrum of the disease, which is why I was able to come here today. Uh, three other people were supposed to come today, but they could not make it. Um, I put in a meeting request with your office about a week and a half ago. Um, I'm hoping that we can meet to discuss this public health crisis um, more. Uh, Chairman Corey Johnson met with us right before he transitioned to his new role. Um, this is a huge public health crisis. There are literally zero dollars uh, being put towards this disease. Um, I'm very concerned about that. I'm also terrified that the one physician who does see people like me is nearing retirement. Thank you so much for speaking out, uh, for coming today and calling our attention to this. Um, did you say how many you estimate, how many people in the five boroughs so have this condition? So we don't have a good estimate for that because nobody's tracking our disease. Um, we estimate that there's between 52,000 and 152,000 people in New York State. Um, one of the packets of material I gave to you, we were able to work with New York State Health Commissioner Howard Zucker, who released a letter last May to over 85,000 physicians informing them about this disease. He calls for people to take this disease seriously and for physicians and other medical providers to put it on their differential diagnosis. Well, there must then be tens of thousands in the five boroughs if you have such a high number in, in the state. And yes. um, again, I, I, I'm glad you've come today to speak out on this and appreciate your bravery uh, and, and your eloquence on the topic and look forward to meeting with you uh, and your team in the near future. Great, I'll follow up with your office today. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, sir? Good afternoon, my name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the Executive Director of the Commission on the Public's Health System. I'm gonna condense my uh, long testimony. Uh, let me just uh, state that um, one of the things that we work on as the Commission is protecting the public hospitals and the true safety net services that they provide. And I think it's in paramount to, uh, to make sure that community advocates with the government can change the narrative about New York City's tale of two healthcare systems. One which the wealthy and those with better insurance coverage receive VIP care and others face obstacles to timely care and lesser quality services. And so we want to ensure that the city works with us and other advocates with the mayor to ensure that indigent care pools that the public hospitals deserve and other safety nets are, pro are fairly distributed and to um, push for the enhanced safety net legislation that Governor Cuomo keeps vetoing, even though both houses, the Senate and the Assembly, have uh, passed it unanimously together. 
I wanted to say that also, we have to continue ensuring that our public hospitals are, are well resourced, even though we have to make them accountable for those resources, it's important to do that. And that also that any affected communities, patients and healthcare workers that are affected by any restructuring efforts must have a direct role in formulating and proposing changes in New York City's health and hospital structure and services. I do want to mention that you mentioned this before, um, Councilman Levine, about Action Health NYC. That task force with the Immigrant Healthcare Task Force have recommended a direct access program for the uninsured immigrants. And we think um, coming out of that, that program needs to be continued, how to build off of that from Action Health NYC um, through funding or so on. Also think that we have to continue demanding for fair distribution of state dollars to the public hospitals. Also demand that the state in terms of the proceeds that are coming out of the conversion of assets from Fidelis, that it changes and moves that forward. But I want to say in terms of the last one is Access Health NYC, uh, which not to confuse it with Action Health NYC is important because you mentioned about reaching the uninsured. And one area that even though there are navigators in ACA, they do not have funding to really do the outreach. It's around enrollment. And so if the community bases are the key, they reach those hard to reach populations and we could hit numbers even higher if it expands it to 2.5 million, given what you have stated before. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. It's, it's great to see you again. So to, just to understand the last point you were making, uh, you said there's a distinction between Action Health NYC and... Access Health NYC. Got it, of course, which is the City Council initiative. Correct. Uh, which, which we strongly support. And you're saying it's currently funded at 2.5 million? No, it's currently uh, funded at 1.7. So you and your coalition members have put in a request to take it up to 2.5 million. And one of the benefits of that would be more outreach for healthcare enrollment. Including more boroughs being covered in terms of more CBOs in terms of communities. And that, that community service society will be able to have expansion of their, uh, of their hotline. And New York Immigration calling their trainees and, and our other two partners, coalition and federation, process welfare agency, to do more of that work. Including what we work together in terms of a guide. Because it's not just about outreach and, and access, it's also knowing your rights to those options and coverage. Well, I'm a strong supporter of the Access Initiative. Um, this was championed by our then Health Committee Chair and now Speaker, Cora Johnson, and uh, uh, I and others will certainly be pushing for it. We're, we're hoping uh, that as the budget negotiations proceed that we'll have some good news on that front. Um, but, but thank you for your advocacy, so please. Hi, hello, my name is Stephanie Rees. I'm a social work intern at Live on New York. Uh, I will be reading a shortened version of the testimony. A uh, completed version is what has been provided. Um, so first of all, we would like to thank Chairman Levine and to the entire committee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Live on New York also thanks Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Johnson, and the entire City Council for their consideration of senior needs as the FY19 budget process moves forward. Live on New York is a member organization with a base of more than 100 community-based organizations serving over 300,000 older New Yorkers annually. Live on New York also administers a citywide outreach program that screens older adults for benefits such as SNAP and SCREEN. Finally, Live on New York proudly administers the Senior Medicare Patrol Program for the entire state, a program aimed at preventing costly Medicare fraud, which is integral to the success of our healthcare system as it is estimated that fraud and errors make up roughly 10% of Medicare spending. When looking at New York's healthcare system, it is important that this view takes on the full landscape of health impacting services and providers. For older adults, while services funded through the city department for the aging, such as senior centers, home delivered meals, or affordable senior housing with services are non-medical by definition, their impact has a uniquely positive effect on the overall health of a senior and a reduction in costs that would otherwise be imposed on our healthcare system. The work of community-based service providers has significant health impacts from lowering rates of depression to preventing isolation to even reducing hospitalization rates for older adults. For example, given that studies now show that loneliness surpasses obesity as an early predictor of morbidity, the ability for senior centers to provide socialization is key to combating this risk factor. Another great example of this value can be found in the recent study by Self-Help Community Services that looked at residents in their independent senior affordable housing with services program. The study compared Medicaid data for residents in self-help buildings in two zip codes and compared it to other seniors living in the same zip code over two years. Under there. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We love Live On. 
Uh, I don't know how you're going to replace Bobby Sackman, but uh, I'm hoping you, you fill those shoes. And your point is so important. Um, health is intimately tied to diet and housing mm -hmm. and um, even a number of social factors. And so if you only focus on the doctor's office okay. and not some of these broader social needs, then um, you're really only engaging in half the fight. So uh, I couldn't agree more, and, and we thank you and Live On for, for calling our attention to that. Thank you. All right, please. Thank you to Chairman Levine, um, Council Member Barron, and the excellent City Council staff for your commitment to making New York a he healthier, more equitable place and for your attention to the growing threat of tuberculosis in New York. My name is Erica Lessam, and I'm from Treatment Action Group. TAG is an independent, activist, community-based HIV research and policy think tank. We at TAG and our partners representing immigrant communities, housing rights, and public health expertise share your alarm at TB's recent rise in New York. TB is airborne and infectious, meaning anyone who breathes is at risk. But as you mentioned, Chair, TB disproportionately affects the most vulnerable, those with weakened immune systems, people living in crowded settings, and our immigrant communities. As you heard from Commissioner Bassett, despite being preventable and curable, TB is on the rise in New York for the first time in over 25 years. Also increasing at a rapid pace are cases of drug-resistant TB, which are more difficult and costly to treat. A single average case of drug-resistant TB costs almost $300,000 to treat. This resurgence of TB is a direct result of years of underinvestment in the public health response to TB in New York City. Um, thank you for your commitment stated today to um, push for restored funding at the city and state level. I enclosed in written testimony a letter from dozens of your constituents and leading organizations in New York asking for a restoration of New York City funding to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of TB Control on the order of almost $15 million this year, um, or sorry, in the, the coming year. That would be a, a $6.3 million increase over the current year's funding. We're making similar requests at the state and federal levels. Investing in the public health response to TB now will save us billions down the road. It would allow for proactive outreach by community organizations to raise awareness about TB and provide preventive services and screening. Um, it could restore clinic facilities that meet patient needs. I enclosed in the testimony um, a picture of um, one of the clinics in Corona, which is in district repair. Um, and it would allow for sufficient staffing to provide coordinated, culturally competent care. Um, I just want to remind us that um, we're in grave danger of repeating history. The outbreak in the 70s and 80s that were a direct result of decreased funding for TB cost over $1 billion to control. Um, so we thank you for your attention to TB, for the commitments stated today, and we look forward to your leadership to make them come true. Well, thank you to you and, and TAG for uh, raising the alarm on this. I, after the commissioner finished testi testimony, uh, I was passed a note to say it says that we used to fund TB at 33.6 million a year, and it's now fallen to I forget the exact number, but low 20s. And um, perhaps the blame lies with the state for their funding cuts, but this is so serious that uh, in the absence of state funding, the city is going to have to step up. And as I observed. When the commissioner was testifying, um, the city used to put a lot more resources to this. Now, those cuts happened under the Bloomberg administration, but I think it falls on this administration, uh, particularly in the absence of state funding, to step up to the plate and put more money to this. So you said we spent a billion dollars yes. in the 70s outbreak. What was that the, spent the on? The outbreak was in the early 90s, but it was a result of funding cuts in the 70s and 80s. Um, so there were thousands of cases, um, mostly among um, people in homeless communities It started. Um, that was in an era of very crowded um, shelter ho housing. Um, and then uh, it spread, the, this very um, drug resistant strain spread into New York City hospitals where people were immunocompromised. The death rates were very high. I think over 86% of people died who had this strain. And because of funding cuts, um, there wasn't appropriate treatment but there also wasn't um, a laboratory structure in place to be able to diagnose that TB. Um, so we have a much more committed health response today, um, and the health department, I think, is, is paying much more attention than they were in those days. Um, but we're definitely in danger of repeating history because we're seeing um, the you know, increase in trends following a, a history of 
um, decimated funding for TB. And it, it does include um, a reduction of about 50% in city funding since 2007 levels, um, on top of the cuts from the state and the, the um, federal government that we're seeing. Right, so we used to put maybe 20 million and now it's down to 10 million? In 2007, city funding was at 16.4 million for TB. Right. Now it's 8.59. Got it. So half. And um, yes, the, t the total amount of funding was 33.6 after adjusting for inflation in 2007, and now we're at 14.89. Okay, well, we will be working uh, with you and other advocates on this uh, intensely, no doubt, in the future. I'm sorry we don't have more time, uh, but, uh, but thank you for speaking out today, and Thanks thank for you for attention. this great panel. All right, we're going to go next to Suzanne Robinson Davis. Uh, I think it might be Shakti Castro, sorry if I'm uh, from Boom Health, sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. We have Isabel Abreu from Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. We have Enrique Herbes from uh, Hanek and Tammy Ewan uh, from the YMCA of Queens. Uh, this is a panel focusing on uh, the wonderful initiative um, of Access Health. Okay, would you like to start us off? Did you press your button? Good afternoon, my name is Shakti Castro and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Boom Health Harm Reduction Center in the Bronx. We serve the Bronx community with an array of services, including prevention, syringe access, housing, legal and advocacy and wellness services. I'm here to support the Access Health Initiative by urging the City Council to fund access at $2.5 million for the upcoming fiscal year. At Boom, we work with people who exist at the intersections of several marginalized identities. Through Access Health NYC, we're able to bring our harm reduction approach to health education, meeting people where they are without judgment and connecting them to the services, information, and coverage they need to lead healthy lives and make choices that work for them. The educational workshops and groups that we have conducted have helped us empower our community with knowledge and confidence in a judgment-free environment, helping them to understand their health coverage and advocate for themselves as patients. Many New Yorkers are navigating a changing and confusing healthcare system, and through Access Health, we are able to direct outreach in under and uninsured communities, including new immigrants, Spanish speakers, and the LGBTQ community. Since we started working with the Access Health Initiative in 2015, we have been able to reach 20,000 individuals through community outreach, workshops, groups, tabling events, and social media. This fiscal year alone, we've had almost 40 groups, workshops, and events that have helped us reach some of the most vulnerable members of our community. And we've been able to connect them with info related to diabetes, hepatitis C, HIV, AIDS, and substance use disorder, as well as connect them to resources for their mental health and nutritional needs. These issues affect a disproportionate number of Bronx residents. We have the highest asthma rates in the state at 47.6 per 10,000. And when it comes to Latinas diagnosed with HIV, almost 48% of them reside in the Bronx. Access Health has helped us to address these entrenched health inequalities through education and linkage to treatment services. And I urge the City Council to continue funding this initiative at $2.5 million. That was impeccable timing. If you, could, if you could tutor some of my colleagues on the City Council, I would be very grateful. Um, I'm, I'm a huge believer in the harm reduction model, and, and I thank you for the work you're doing in the Bronx and for speaking out today on this important initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lemuel Boyd, and I am the health educator on the Access Health NYC initiative at the Bedford Stuyvesant Family Health Center, a federally qualified health center located in Brooklyn. Our center is a safety net facility that targets the media within our community. The SS Health Initiative has opened up a whole new world to the center and the community. The center is more involved in the community, advocating and extending itself beyond our routine business. We are working with the community to restore renewed hope to people who previously thought that they were just stacked against them. Recently, a young man approached me while I was tabling outside of a drug treatment facility. 
I began my elevator pitch telling him about all the services we could offer him on the spot. I indicated to him our insurance navigator who could help him and offer our free HIV and Hep C tests. At this point, he proceeded to tell me that the Department of Health had contacted him about an STD infection of which he was very troubled and really burdened. He was not sure of the next steps. I was able to counsel him and he agreed to get treatment. He has started his treatment and is ready to move on with his life. This story and the stories of many others represent the everyday life experiences of regular New Yorkers are what drive our work. The Essence Health Initiative makes a significant difference. It changes the landscape, it provides hope in the midst of fear and uncertainty. It is a pathway for everyone who calls New York City home. Your work at the council is ever so important. Although we know the budget is real tight, we call on you to refund the initiative and refund at a higher financial commitment of $2.5 million. Thank you for this opportunity and your kind attention. Now I'm starting to think that you guys rehearsed the timing of your remarks, <laughs> uh, which would be a great precedent. Um, and so you, you are, you are, um, Lemuel, Lemuel, is that how you say your first Lemuel, name? Lemuel. Lemuel. Yes. So you are, you are um, a colleague of Suzanne Robinson Davis, is that right, who couldn't be here and you're speaking on her behalf? Yes, correct. Okay. And Bed-Stuy Family Health Center is one of the coalition members of Access Health. Correct. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for the work you do and, and for your testimony today. Please. Could, could you check if your mic is on? Speak on? Oh, all right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the New York City Council Committee. My name is Tammy Yun, uh, a healthcare navigator at the YWC of Queens. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to testify on behalf of the SS Health New York City Initiates budget proposal of $2.5 million for the fiscal year in uh, 2019. I would like to say thank you to the City Council Speaker Corey Johnson and New York City Council Committee of Health for three years support of our continuous SS Health program. SS Health New York City has offered funds in training our navigators to keep our train to keep our skills and knowledge up to date. We are dedicated to provide fair health insurance enrollment services for our clients through the New York State of Health Marketplace. We cooperate with the community-based organization to help children, families, and individual to obtain low cost health care as, 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 as well as social services such as NAP, cash assistance, rent assistance, housing application, and other free services. We have language uh, translation in Korean, Chinese, and Spanish for immigrants who are not speaking English. I would like to share an example of my outreach at Flushing Green Market last November. I hand out health care flyer to a volunteer who was working at the information booth. She said she did not know we can enroll people to government health insurance. She wanted to refer her parents to our services because her parents can only speak Chinese. As has held, New York City now becomes a community-based program. We need the fund to sustain local health programs through education. This April, I will represent New York State of Health to assist consumers with information about the marketplace at Richwood YMCA Health Kids Day, I will let the parents know that I can enroll their kids to government health insurance. We want to ensure as many children as parents and parents as possible are enrolled in health care, in health insurance. I'm here today to share my story and urge the council for its support of 2.5 million for the SS Health New York City program. All right. <coughs> Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Ewan, uh, for your great work and the work of the Queens YMCA on this yes. important matter, and thank you to this panel. Next up, we're going to hear from Aswini Parismani, Parasami from uh, F Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, Max Handel from New York Immigration Coalition, Clara Londano from Plaza del Sol, or Clara Londano from Plaza del Sol, uh, Mahatie from the Arab American Family Support Center, and Chris Widello, of course, from AARP. What's that? Actually, Chris, 
We're going to put you on the next panel so you're partnering with some like-minded advocates. <laughs> so, okay. Hi there. Thank you so much. You can just call me Wynn, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will. But Thank my you. name is Wynn Perry Asami, and I'm with FPWA, um, <laughs> and I am so excited for the opportunity to speak to you all about um, Access Health NYC, an initiative close to all of our hearts. Um, and we thank you so much for the health committee's support over the last few years of this initiative. Um, so this last year has made it increasingly clear what a lot of us always knew, that health is critical and un can be very underappreciated um, in terms of what it means to our communities when you don't, when communities of color, when LGBTQ communities, um, low income, other vulnerable and hard to reach populations don't know that their health access is secure, um, they start deprioritizing their health and this affects their ability to live holistic and full lives and to really contribute to a city like New York in total. And that's where um, health outreach services become so important and critical. Um, this is what Access Health NYC is about, is, is about providing uh, culturally appropriate and responsible, uh, responsive, linguistically appropriate uh, services so that people feel comfortable actually accessing their health services. Um, and so we just really want to uh, encourage the council to um, enhance from 1 million to 2.5 million this year so that more organizations and more communities can be served in the way that they deserve. Um, thank you, Wen. Uh, powerfully stated, and I think you were here earlier, I'm not sure, when we spoke to the commissioner on um, one of the important priorities you have in this project, which is getting people health insurance. And uh, it is important that government employees be prepared to do that work, but that's not always going to be effective, and we do need people who are on the ground in communities speaking the language literally with the cultural competence and, and the trust um, who are also doing that work. And the city actually is putting very little resources, if you don't count the Access Health, Access Health Initiative, to that priority. The state does more. Um, so I'm a strong advocate for expanding the pool of resources for uh, the work that, uh, that your organization and others are doing on the ground. So thank you. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Max Hadler. I'm the senior health policy manager at the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, thank you very much to Chairman Levine for calling this hearing and for the opportunity to testify for the first time in front of the committee in its current composition. Um, we've heard a lot about Access Health NYC, so I won't go over the same details again, just to say that my organization coordinates the training for all of the other awardees, and we are uh, front row witnesses of all the amazing work that they are doing and that we're all doing as part of the initiative and just want to underscore the importance of growing the funding for the initiative as a way of growing the, the initiative geographically across the city so we know that there's amazing work being done by the organizations that have testified here today and in the other of the 13 council districts that are currently funded but the only way to really stretch this work beyond that current reach is to uh, enhance the funding um, up to 2.5 million. Um, so I want to switch gears and talk about a similarly named but very different program, the Action Health NYC pilot that the city undertook in 2016 and 17, which was a really important initiative to address the challenges that uninsured, undocumented New Yorkers continue to face in accessing health care. Action Health NYC tested important innovations in improving health access and continuity for immigrants uh, excluded from federally funded insurance programs, including enrolling individuals in a branded program designed to link them to a primary care provider, linking services at health and hospitals with federally qualified health centers, and ensuring enhanced care coordination across those different settings. Uh, the pilot evaluation showed that enrollees were more likely to receive preventive services to receive a diagnosis of a chronic condition than a comparable control group, and participants reported that the program made it easier to get health care when they needed it and in a more friendly, accessible, and less chaotic manner. That said, we are extremely disappointed that the Action Health NYC pilot was discontinued without a concrete plan to incorporate lessons learned and to build out a sustainable uninsured care program in the city. 
We strongly urge the city to ensure that the lessons of Action Health NYC are incorporated into Health and Hospitals Fee Scale Options Program or some other comprehensive initiative, and we look forward to working with the council to ensure that this happens. And I am not as good of a time manager as my colleagues, but I also just want to say that the NYIC is a very strong supporter of the enhanced funding for TB control that Erica and the TAG group mentioned uh, before because this is a, a disease that disproportionately affects immigrant New Yorkers. Um, thank you, and uh, as you may have heard before, I, I strongly concur with um, your statement that we need a solution, a permanent, uh, broad solution for undocumented New Yorkers so they have access to basic health care services, including primary care, and, and we plan on working uh, with your coalition and others uh, to make that a reality. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Clara Londono. I am part of Urban Health Plan. I am working in Plaza del Sol Health Center. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We as Urban Health Plan has historically worked with underserved communities and has proactive sought to create a presence in the poor and underserved neighborhoods. These neighborhoods also tend to have larger concentration of the three largest superpopulation on an insurance and has high risk individuals, adolescents, low wage workers, immigrants, and LGBT population. The objective is to reach out, inform, and engage the population in Corona, Queens, Jackson Heights, Elmos, and East Elmos. I will say, to, like to compense everything that we are telling you, is that we are a network, a network organization. That's why we need the $2.5 million, because we are working with the city. We are working with organizations that the population believe on, and we are helping this organization to reach the people that believe in us and to give a best health and access to resources that we have here. Without this organization, I really think that the city is not providing what you need to provide to the community. Thank you so much. Gracias, Doña Clara. Le agradecemos su, su participación en esto hoy, el labor que está haciendo Plaza del Sol. Mm -hmm. eh, que está ubicado donde? En Queens era? Corona, Queens. Corona, Queens. In, okay. Mm -hmm. just, just clarifying for the record that Plaza del Sol is in Corona, Queens, and uh, we are very glad that you're part of the coalition, and thank you for speaking out today. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Okay, ahora pasamos al próximo panel. Uh, Donna Tilgren, who uh, is a representative of Local 372, as well as Mr. Kevin Allen, also from 372. And uh, we are now going to call uh, the great Chris Widello from AARP, uh, who has a fan club with him today and every day, uh, and as well as Kimberly McKenzie from the Sylvia Rivera Law Project and Andrea Bauer um, from Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition. So we have a, a great panel with some diverse perspectives. And would, would Donna or Kevin from 372, are they still here? Looks like we missed them. We'll have to catch them on another round. OK, Chris, would you like to kick us off? Good afternoon, Chairman Levine and members of the Health Committee. Uh, my name is Chris Widello. I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York. And on behalf of our 800,000 members, age 50 and older in New York City, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you for the numerous volunteers that came out today uh, to be here to support me. Um, so no surprise, uh, New York City's uh, population is aging. And nearly one third of residents in the five boroughs are over the age of 50. And that group is expect expected to grow by nearly 20% by the year 2040. The growth for the age 65 plus group is projected to be even more dramatic, a whopping 40% increase. And our city is not just aging, uh, we are becoming more diverse. African American, Blacks, Hispanics, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders account for 62% of New York City residents age 50 and older. And half of all those 65 and older living here were born in a foreign country. We know from our recent report, Disrupting Racial and Ethnic Disparities, Solutions for New Yorkers Age 50 and Older, 
uh, developed in partnership with the New York Urban League, the NAACP, Hispanic Federation, and Asian American Federation, that people of color over the age of 50 experience stark disparities in areas of health, economic security, and the ability to live and remain in their communities. All of this means that we must take meeting the needs of older New Yorkers, making, uh, all this means that meeting the needs of older New Yorkers needs to become a bigger priority. We are grateful to the increased and in baseline funding uh, increases that have been made in the DIFTA budget last year, but aging is not just a department for the aging issue. That is why we're here today along with some of our New York City members, and that is why we plan to attend many budget hearings um, with different agencies. It is time for the needs of aging New Yorkers to be addressed across city government. After all, meeting the needs of aging residents and helping them stay in their neighborhoods is critical to retaining their tremendous economic, social, cultural, and family contributions, and it's also the right thing to do. One of the keys to helping our older neighbors to continue to live in the neighborhoods they call home is ensuring they remain healthy. Uh, this is a big in undertaking in a city like New York, and um, there are a number of priorities that have been laid out by the New York City Age Friendly, uh, uh, New York City Age Friendly Initiative, and the uh, Age Friendly New York City New Commitments for a City for All Ages. Uh, the report addresses several health disparities, particularly as they um, relate to increasing utilization of services among older people, including including those who are homebound. Um, for example, the city's efforts to train health and social, well, social service workers who with homebound older adults on specific risk factors for injury and illness and best practices for prevention. Uh, this is one of the recommendations that has been made and we're curious as to where the health department is with this program, how successful has it been and how many seniors need uh, better trained providers. Um, Beyond that, the city is looking across networks to improve health outcomes. For example, the effort to forge connections between health care provider networks and aging provider network, uh, including marketing falls prevention programming, uh, including marketing falls pre prevention programming to health care providers. How successful has that program been? Um, I provided you all with copies of the testimony, so I won't take any more of your time, but the bottom line is that we hope that all discussions that will happen here today and in the future and all budget hearings will consider the needs of aging New Yorkers. Let's disrupt aging together and help ensure that New Yorkers can age safely and happily in the city they love. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for um, the incredible partnership which a AARP has given to, to uh, the City Council and myself personally. and. Thank you for coming, not just to the Committee on Aging, but to the Committee on Health. Yes. And as your signs uh, effectively sum, sum up, uh, aging is a health issue and health is an aging issue, it's obvious. And we do need to do more to make sure that we consider the senior's angle to every issue we're considering in this committee. And I very much look forward to partnering with you um, uh, as, as we formulate policy that is responsive uh, to the needs of older New Yorkers. Thank you. Appreciate so, it. Looking forward to it. Likewise. All right. Please. Good afternoon, Chair Levine and Council staff. Um, my name is Andrea Bowen, and Kimberly and I are part of um, something we call the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition, which is a coalition of several organizations, including Sylvia Rivera Law Project, um, Anti-Violence Project, the LGBT Center, um, Make the Road New York, uh, Audre Lord Project, it goes on and on. Um, uh, in 2015, the LGBT Caucus of City Council um, uh, worked with the organizations to start a series of community forums to hear what the uh, transgender and gender nonconforming community or TGNC community needed um, from City Council. Um, last fall, um, after having gone through five borough forums, we put together a policy brief um, uh, called Solutions Out of Struggle and Survival, and we've boiled that down to six budget asks. Um, we've been making these asks of the mayor, um, and in the uh, event that the asks don't end up in the executive budget, we'd like council support in making this happen. Um, the specific reason why we're here today is we've made a pitch to DOHMH uh, and H&H &H, um, uh, for a TGNC healthcare liaison program. Um, one of the things that has come out of conversations with community members, and Kimberly can talk about this a little bit more, um, is uh, people need connections to care. Um, the TGNC community, uh, just sort of speaking broadly, um, faces health outcomes that are 
Uh, I'd say more dire than non-TGNC people, non-TGNC LGB people. In a 2015 Health and Human Services survey, 15.8% of TGNC respondents reported fair or poor health compared with 9.6% of uh, cisgender LGB respondents. Um, there are many similar statistics like that. Um, and so one of the things that came out of these um, borough-wide sessions was a need for healthcare liaisons, people who can connect people um, connect people to doctors, connect the doctors to health insurance, connect um, patients to aftercare, and overall make sure that um, patients get the best experience possible. Um, and this would cost $820,000. Um, that's mostly money for staffing with a little left over to advertise the services. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Kimberly. Thank you, Anna. Okay, Kimberly. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Kimberly McKenzie, Director of Outreach and Community Engagement at the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. I would first like to give so much thanks to Chair Mike, Mark Levine of the committee and also all of the council members here in attendance. At the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, we work to guarantee that all people are free to self-determine their gender identity and expression regardless of income or race and without facing harassment discrimination or violence. Uh, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project is a collective organization founded on the understanding that gender identity is, uh, that gender is self-determination is inextricably intertwined with racial, social, and economic justice. Therefore, we seek to increase the political voice and visibility of low-income people and people of color who are transgender, intersex, or gender nonconforming. The Sylvia Rivera Law Project works to improve access to respectful and affirming social, health, and legal services for our communities. We believe that in order to create meaningful political participation and leadership, we must have access to the basic means of survival and safety from violence. As part of the Transform Coalition, in which several community organizations serving transgender, gender nonconforming, and intersex people held forums in all five boroughs to understand the needs of our community. We have taken an active role in addressing the needs of our TGNC communities. Through our TGNC community recommendations, we have collaboratively formed a policy brief called Solutions Out of Struggle and Survival, available at avp.org solutions. To expand policy and budget solutions with specific proposals, to funding initiatives that support TGNC lives and economic sustainability. I am here to testify on behalf of supporting our proposed TGNC healthcare liaison program, which we have proposed to D DOHMH and the Health and Hospitals Corporation and would cost $820,000. Um, $820, As part of our coalitional efforts, we recommend that DOHMH and the Health and Hospitals Corporation provide supportive services that include hiring a culturally, a culturally competent TGNC liaisons at city hospitals who understand and respect TGNC identities and their healthcare needs. Too many times our communities have witnessed incompetent services at hospitals that don't address them with incorrect pronouns and have witnessed um, furthermore experiences of discrimination which contribute to the risk of negative health care outcomes and violence against our communities with little to no access to affirming health care services. It is vitally important that TGNC communities feel affirmed and visible in these public health settings while taking the next steps to ensure support supportive uh, affirming health care of our TGNC communities and overall visibility of TGNC communities' lives. This is why we need DOH, MH, and h, &H to fund the TGNC Healthcare Liaison Program, and if they do not, we seek council support in funding this new program. Thank you, and you may contact me at Kimberly at SRLP.org. Thank you, Kimberly and Anna. I, I want to read this report that you've produced. Maybe you can send it to my office. Absolutely. Um, I and I appreciate you bringing this up. Are there any private hospitals which have such positions? Is this a case where the public sector is behind the private sector? Um, I'd say that, sorry. I'd, no, no, I guess you go. <laughs> um, I'd say that um, 
Mount Sinai is sort of recognized as one of the leaders in doing this. I mean, um, they have a dedicated surgical unit now. Yeah, they have a dedicated health, surgical right. unit. Um, they have a lot of staff covering this. Um, and I'd say the H and H actually also has a, a, like a TGNC liaison, and they do have healthcare navigators in the system. Um, but we're, what we're looking for is given what you know Kimberly's heard through organizing work. Um, you know, people are lacking connections to aftercare, doctors aren't really making the connections with insurance that they need, and so having dedicated TGNC, like navigators, or as we're calling them, liaisons, um, is something that's not within the h, h system that would really, and that we'd also like to see applied across the entire, you know, public and private systems, um, that would be really, really helpful. I'm sorry we don't have more time to go into this now, but I truly thank you for bringing it up and uh, would love to work with your team on this issue. Yeah, and we have a longer list of all of our other proposals attached to my testimony. I look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, we've been joined by Donna Tillman from 372, please. Just press the button. Okay, sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Um, healthcare Committee Chair Levine and distinguished members of the committee. It is the honor of Local 372 New York City Board of Education Employees, District Council 37 AFSCME, to present testimony on behalf of the 279 Substance Abuse Prevention and Intervention Specialist, otherwise known as SAPIS. We represent under the leadership of President D. Francois the First. Um, I'm also joined here by my partner, my uh, Coach, um, yes, I, I understand she's now here. She can come. Is it uh, Ms. Abreu? Kevin, no, Kevin Allen. Ah, sorry. She's here and Executive Vice President uh, Mesbit of Local 372 and Secretary Treasurer uh, David Key. Got so it. what we would like for you to know is that SAP has provided essential prevention and intervention services for the 1.2 million public school students um, in New York City. Uh, today's youth are more vulnerable than ever before due to the growing uh, drug abuse um, epidemic. Our message is a simple one. The more support and resources we can offer to our at-risk youth, the more productive they will be in the future. So we're coming before you today to ask you for your continued commitment to our students by providing a total of $4 million in next year's budget for SAPIS, a renewal of the original $2 million and to, and to add and to maintain the current um, staffing levels and to add additional increase of another two million to hire an additional 25 counselors to reach thousands of more um, children. Uh, me and Mr. Allen and our local would like for you to know that we love our children and we love our work. Not only do we uh, counsel children, um, we also provide we have a we have a, a curriculum whereas we teach children social skills. Just three minutes. Where we teach children social skills, leadership, um, decision making, um, and we also teach our kids how to be assertive, how not to give in to peer pressure, and things of that nature. So we don't only do drug prevention. And are you yourself, Ms. Tillman, a SAPIS counselor? Yes, I'm a SAPIS counselor, and so is Mr. Allen. And what, I work what? in an elementary school, and Mr. Allen works in a middle school. Wait, which school are you at? Are you in more I than one? I am in PS 189 in the Bronx in District 11. And how long have you been uh, a counselor? Um, I started in December of 2001. Thank you so much for dedicating your life to this career. It's very impactful Thank and you. more needed now than ever, I'm Thank afraid. You. And thank you for testifying. Mr. Allen? We just wanted to add that we find ourselves being very unique because we cover students from A to Z and from kindergarten to the 12th grade. And we noticed that being 12-month employees, we are very rare. Most guidance counselors and social workers usually have a defined niche that they use and also with us being able to use evidence-based curriculum that addresses the needs. When we look at life skills, too good for drugs, and second step, and guiding good choices, and teen intervene as some of the evidence-based curriculum, we find that we're able to impact. But what we're more excited about 
is our impact in schools that sometimes is quantitative and sometimes is qualitative. You can see the results automatically in some cases and over the period of time, we see the results and we're excited about that and the ability to create what we call positive alternatives. We have several counselors with various skill sets, whether it's in the arts, whether it's music, whether it's drama, whether it's creativity, playwriting, filmmaking. The school that I'm in, which is also the same building as Ms. Tillman, is in the process of building a recording studio and a dance studio because we know the positive alternative is the solution. And if I tell you what to do, it will urge you and make you more proactive about what not to do. So we have a compassion, we have a heart for this work, and we believe that the best is yet to come in New York City. Well, th thank you, Mr. Allen, very eloquently stated. With the unfortunate rise of the opioid crisis, we need you and your colleagues on the front lines. And if I'm not mistaken, the ranks of SAPIS counselors have dropped over the years. Yes. Yes, I believe sir. there was 500 at a peak and that it's now down to 300, do I have that right? Yes. At one point, at one point less than a decade ago, it was 1,200. So, so it had been, it'd been 1,200 and- 1,200 to less than- In the early 2000s, and now it's down to how much? To 271 to 270. So that's, we're moving in exactly the wrong direction, considering the crisis we're confronting, and I will certainly be working to push for more funding to expand the ranks of staff as counselors in this budget. Thank you for speaking out today and for sharing Thank your stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next panel, we're going to get um, Maha Tie, Isabel Abreu, Elaine Budrick Hunter. Alice, Alicia Vassens, sorry for mispronouncing that, and Robin Vitale. We only have four chairs, so I'll ask the fifth of you if you're here just to um, wait a moment and then we'll rotate out when one of you f finishes speaking. We have a lot of folks who want to testify. It's a good problem to have. Would you like to kick us off? Is it three? Good afternoon. My name is Maha Atiya. I'm Health Program Manager, New York City Health Navigator at the Arab American Family Support Center. I'm not gonna read from here because you're gonna have it. I'll make it short and sweet. I'm here for, uh, to advocate for uh, the budget for access healthcare uh, in, in the budget of two and a half uh, million dollars because we deal with immigrant population. We need the money to reach out to our immigrant population, our, uh, who doesn't speak English, so we could advertise in their uh, native language. And we do uh, lots of outreach in, in the Arabic language for our community, and we serve Arab American, South Asian. So we have staff who speak all these languages. If you include us in the budget, if you add more community-based organization, we'll reach out to more immigrant population in the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for testifying for, for um for working on this important issue. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Isabella Abreu, and um, I'm always in your neighborhood, uh, Councilman uh, Levine, uh, doing access to healthcare work, doing outreach. And so, and I, I wrote it, um, uh, so I don't wanna leave anything important now. So I work for Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, and I'm the outreach coordinator for access to healthcare. Um, and as you all know, we all know, many New Yorkers have no access to health care and other essential services that affect the quality of their lives. And for diverse reasons, uh, many people are not aware that they qualify uh, for health insurance. And uh, sadly, many other people, uh, even though they're aware, they're so afraid to come out and ask for the services that they uh, are entitled to and that uh, impacts the quality of their lives and also their ability, ability to uh, provide for their families. And uh, I have written something different, but this morning um, uh, I received two phone calls that I had to take care of. And uh, one is a 69-year-old uh, immigrant, undocumented, uh, battling pancreatic can uh, cancer. And um, they have been de denied medical care and uh, I, I had to fight. We had to fight uh, as an organization 
um, to secure that he could have access to uh, um, uh, emergency health care, but also through this fight. And thanks to the guidance of the NYIC, Anthony Feliciano, amazing trainings that they provide for our dear organizations, um, I was able to find a way to secure that he's receiving uh, treatment at one of our public hospitals. Then I, I right before jumping on the train, I get another phone call from a desperate family. Their 22-year-old college student has been diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, and they need help securing health insurance and securing that he's going to get treatment. Um, and so that's the reason I was late, not an excuse. Um, but these funds are needed. Um, I joined NIMIC last year um, to uh, do access to health care. And one of the projects that I was given to do was Hike the Heights as a way to bring more than 1,000 community members to one of our public parks and have different vendors and health navigators provide information about health insurance. Human right, um, access to health care is a human right, and we need to continue taking pride on being a progressive and a society and a society that embraces diversity and that we recognize the humanity in others regardless of their Thank immigration you. status. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, Nimic is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, the, the anecdotes you shared about uh, real life stories of impact uh, really were great to hear and, and proves how important the program is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elaine Hunter, and I want to thank Chairman Levine and all the members of New York City Council's Committee on Health for the opportunity to present testimony on behalf of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center. I'm honored to speak to you and share my perspective as someone who has a PhD in neuroscience from Columbia, but is also a volunteer with experience working on the Samaritan Suicide Prevention Hotline. As you know, suicide, the tragic and ultimate symbol of untreated mental health, has increased in the city the last three years, causing almost as many fatalities as homicide and auto accidents combined. As you're probably aware, each year one in five New Yorkers experiences a mental disorder, and that 60% of them will never receive care, destroying lives and families, and costing New York $1.8 billion from suicide alone. But suicide and suicide prevention should not just be confined to the mental health sector. For every health problem, but from Alzheimer's, diabetes, and AIDS to Zika, has potential that can lead to depression and self-destructive behavior. Samaritans experience answering over 1.3 million calls from New Yorkers in distress tells us that every illness, no matter its severity, often leads people to feel overwhelmed and insecure, hopeless and helpless, powerless to overcome their situation, creating a potentially serious problem. In fact, research tells us that the majority of general practitioners fail to perform even basic depression screenings on their patients during exams, possibly missing a golden opportunity to identify psychological and behavioral problems, and even more important, to be in a position to address it. This is why Samaritans encourages you to advocate for enhanced suicide prevention training, not just for the school system, but for every city contracted health agency and department, and emphasize the need for them to utilize at least some basic depression screening tool and suicide risk assessment model. Samaritans has a proposal before the council speaker for fiscal year 2019 to address this need that we hope you will consider supporting. Our Caring Community Suicide Prevention Education Project will advance integration of suicide prevention education and procedural planning for government, nonprofit, academic, and community organizations that serve New York City's culturally diverse at-risk populations. I thank the committee for its time and appreciate your attention to the physical and emotional well-being of all New Yorkers. Thank you so much. It, it's, it's a difficult topic and one that people shy away from addressing, unfortunately, and it needs to be brought to the light of day. Um, and so we, we appreciate you being here and speaking out. I look forward to wor working with you. Um, I am needed for a vote across the street in the Education Committee. So you're going to be in the hands of our capable colleague and Health Committee member, uh, Council Member Keith Powers. So I'm sadly going to miss Robin's testimony. But I know <laughs> that AHA is doing amazing work and that you have a very holistic view of health policy. Um, that goes way beyond um, directly heart-related matters to uh, really look a concern for the broader health of the New Yorkers, and I thank you for that. And I will be back in a few minutes. So take it away. I'm the less attractive chair, but nevertheless, <laughs> please continue. 
Thank you, Council Member. Um, as mentioned, my name is Robin Vitale. I serve as the Vice President of um, Health Strategies for the American Heart Association here in New York City. And we are thrilled to be here to present kind of the top notes of our budget priorities that we're recommending for the city to invest in um, for FY19. Um, specifically, we're looking for the city to dedicate dollars to support the mission of the American Heart Association um, by helping to promote access to healthy foods um, for all New Yorkers, preventing um, tobacco addiction, as well as improving management of high blood pressure. Under that headline of improving access to healthy foods, we actually have three proposals. We would recommend that the city invest an additional $15 million into helping to expand SNAP um, via the, the Health Bucks initiative. As you're likely aware, one in five New Yorkers receives um, SNAP, and we really do believe that both the economic potential um, as well as the health benefits is deserving of these additional dollars. Um, the second proposal under healthy food access has to do with creating a city-specific healthy food financing initiative. This was something that was done at the state level um, several years ago that unfortunately is now no longer being funded, but it had tremendous impact not only in bringing fruits and vegetables into underserved neighborhoods, um, but also to, uh, to, again, spur the economy. Um, ultimately, a $10 million investment by the city we anticipate would have significant impact building new food markets in neighborhoods that desperately need that that retail um, space. And lastly, under Healthy Food Access, we're recommending a $3 million investment to help um, really bolster the work being done in our smaller retail stores. Um, these corner stores or bodegas are often the lifeline um, for food access to many of our New Yorkers. And we believe a $3 million investment will help to expand the already good work that's going on in the city through the Shop Healthy program. Um, and really being uh, more comprehensive in its approach, working with other community-based organizations um, to expand the reach um, into that those um, much needed neighborhoods. Um, focusing in on uh, tobacco control, as you might be aware, um, a HUD rule is about ready to be implemented and we know that uh, many New Yorkers in um, public housing unfortunately have higher rates of tobacco addiction, so we're recommending a $2 million investment to help support that community specifically with cessation efforts. And lastly, um, around hypertension, we know the city is doing some significant work in this space. We'd recommend a $1 million investment to help make that work sustainable and impactful for the long term. Thank you. And I, just a follow-up question. I, I apologize for missing the other testimonies. I, I presume we have paper copies, so I, I will be able to catch up. Um, on, the, on the retail uh, access to food, small retailers, I assume, presume there's large retailers, too, that could be part of that. And I know some large retailers have taken steps in the last few years to try to expand some, you know, some options, uh, whether it's fruits and vegetables or otherwise. It, can you tell me more about what that program funds and 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 you're asking i think for three million i think it was three million dollars for that program but what where would that money go to and it, what is actually what are the options that are get that are but, but and what's the success rate i guess as well of ensuring that that food actually goes into the corner store and then comes out of the corner store with and home with somebody yeah i appreciate the opportunity to expand because i was trying very hard to hit that two minute mark and it's a challenge to get all the detail uh, in under challenge that timeline indeed, yep. <laughs> Um, so the three million dollar investment we're recommending would be specifically focused um, through the city health department to establish or really expand an existing program um, and really enhance it. Um, the city's shop healthy initiative works with current business owners um, to really promote um, the sale of fruits and vegetables through those markets. Um, so working with a bodega owner, um, whether it's providing some business expertise, um, bringing things in like refrigeration, making it more manageable um, for these businesses to sell perishable food items like fruits and vegetables. Um, you also mentioned the uh, larger store um, market, which I think is another key aspect, because we know many supermarkets have shut down in neighborhoods um, that are uh, obviously quite challenged in the space of healthy food retail. And that's where the second proposal would really be most impactful. Um, the $10 million request that we're making there would establish a city-specific healthy food financing initiative. Um, this is the program that was established at the state initially about six or seven years ago um, under the, the line Healthy Food, Healthy Communities Fund. The Healthy Food, Healthy Communities Fund, with a $10 million investment from the state, um, was um, worked with the Empire State Development Corporation and through that uh, mechanism developed a public-private partnership. Um, they ultimately had a private company provide a two-to-one match for that initial public investment. 
um, resulting in a $30 million nest egg um, that was then um, targeted into underserved neighborhoods across the state of New York. Um, ultimately, it resulted in about 25 new food markets built in neighborhoods that uh, met very specific criteria regarding what that underserved population means. Um, and it also resulted in almost 2,500 jobs. So it really is a fantastic um, mechanism for both healthy food as well as healthy economy. Um, we'll gladly send more information to you, council member, with more information detailing those proposals. But we think all three really are uh, an answer to what the city might be looking for, because it not only helps to create that um, environment to uh, provide fruits and vegetables into the neighborhoods that need it most, but then looking at the SNAP expansion with Health Bucks, you're really thinking about incentivizing New Yorkers to purchase these fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, so it's kind of a, a nice comprehensive approach um, to consider for the, the uh, city to invest in. Great, thank you. I know that the chair, I'm filling in, but I know that he, we certainly, and all, all the members of the committee appreciate all four of you being here and providing testimony. Sometimes these are some of the most important parts of the, the hearings when we get to hear directly from the public about priorities that could go into directly into our communities and our neighborhoods. And so I, I found, I'm, when I was chairing the Criminal Justice Committee, that some new ideas about ways that small investments could result in very large gains uh, came out of the public testimony. So I appreciate everybody being here and providing that testimony. I look forward to reviewing it with the chair and the staff as well to see how the Health Committee can um, you know, advocate for investments that will, I, th I think will have a tremendous gain. So thank you for, for all being thank here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think we have, uh, I think we have one more. Thank you. We're going to hear now from our next panel. We have a few names on here. I think we have five names, but only four seats. This is the world we now live in. Uh, but we uh, will ask when the first person's finished testimony, if they don't mind, to just give up and get, give their seat over. So we're going to call uh, Paulette Spencer from the Bronx Community Health Network, Enrico, Enrique Jervis from Access Health NYC, Hannock. Micah Bookman from Promise Academy, Michael Rogers from New York Roadrunners, and Felicia Cannon, student, student with the New York Roadrunners. Thank you. I think the fifth one's with Roadrunners, right? It's a student here. Thank you for being here. So we'll, uh, we'll get started. Roadrunners, if you want to start. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Rogers, and I serve as Vice President for Youth and Community Runner Engagement at New York Roadrunners. Thanks for this opportunity to testify. Our mission at New York Roadrunners is to help and inspire people through running. I'm here today to talk about physical education in New York City schools which, as we know, is falling short of serving children and meeting New York, City's, New York State standards, particularly those in low-income communities, and, have, and leaving students in danger of becoming obese and remaining habitually inactive throughout their lives. While New York Road Owners is best known for producing the TCS New York City Marathon, organization is also the largest nonprofit provider of free fitness programs in the city. NYR has been providing free physical education and fitness programs for our city's youth since 1999, and in 2016-17 school year, our school-based free programs, fitness events, and resources touched 115,000 New York City students at over 800 schools. Although the city has made significant progress in recent years, there's still a long road to make quality physical education and fitness accessible to all children. New York Road Runners is devoted to making that happen. Our free programs are dedicated, are designed to help all kids pre-K 
through grade 12 build their confidence, motivation, and desire to be physically active for life, hence the term physical liter physically literate. We're in the midst of a health uh, and obesity crisis in New York City, especially for children. Physical activity in schools lays, at, lays the groundwork for a healthy life. It is not an extra. It is a crucial service. Last year, the city responded to this crisis by announcing a universal PE initiative that promises a designated physical education space in all New York City schools by 2021. This, in this initiative acknowledges the vital role physical activity has on a child's education, and the city has, excuse me, and New York Road Owners is here to help provide free programming. We have a request for $500,000 in initiative funding to support our signature program, Rising New York Road Owners, and uh, we have a student here to share a little bit about her experience. Gotcha. I will note that you are, you didn't beat the clock despite being the New York Road Owners, but I will, uh, uh, would you, do you want to have, yep, uh, sure. yeah, thanks. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Felicia, and I'm a rising New York Roadrunners Youth Ambassador. My love for running started back in 2016. I was a sixth grader in MS 577 in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I joined the NYRR Youth Running Program in my school. I was very shy, so I figured running would help keep me active, something I enjoyed. I liked having the support of my teammates without the pressure you get from participating in team sports. This program teaches the fundamentals of running. It doesn't matter if you are the fastest or slowest. Each child is accepted into the program and everyone is treated equal. The program is based on growing a child's ability to stay healthy through running by teaching exercises, drills, and proper nutrition. I had no idea then where, th where this would take me and how I'd fall in love with the whole organization. My mom is disabled and cannot take me running on days when our program did not have practice. So while looking on their website, she realized they have an open run program which is held in 13 parks throughout the five boroughs. We attended an open run in Brooklyn Bridge Park. I sat on a bench nervous to join in. Everyone knew everyone and was having so much fun. The run director approached me and asked me if I would like to join in on the run. That day changed my life. I was among teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, all people that make a community together, running as a family, everyone supporting, teaching, and guiding one another. This was great. Not, not only did I have a safe running environment with people guiding and helping me, but they taught me how to believe in myself, be confident, and help, help me be the leader I am becoming. I now attend three open runs in different parks regularly. Last summer, I was chosen as one of the NYRR running, Rising New York Roadrunners ambassadors. In this program, the boys and girls that are chosen attend a writing and media class held over the summer. Although my favorite part of this program was the multiple public speaking courses we were given. They are continuously helping me throughout my life, my life, whether athletically, academically, emotionally, or socially. As an ambassador, we are trusted with the responsibility of not only representing the Roadrunners organization, but we are also becoming young leaders in the running community. We are the future of not, on, not only as athletes, but as part of our community. And the best part is this program is completely free. I'm now captain of my school track team. I volunteer at a youth running program teaching younger children about running. I am now running on a competitive level with the hopes of making the Junior Olympics one day. And, I, and I've also received an academic scholarship to Monsignor McClancy High School. I can't wait for my 14th birthday when I can officially become a volunteer for youth events for Roadrunners and begin to impact the lives of younger runners as my life was impacted. Thank you. Thank you, it's wonderful. And your public speaking skills are, are on display. You did a great job. And uh, although I will note that I'm more partial to St. Francis Prep's track program where I ran in high school, but glad to hear congratulations on the scholarship. And I'm welcoming the chair back. I'll, we'll, switch, we'll switch our chairs back. It seems like I missed a good one. <laughs> I can't wait to read your testimony. Thank you for being here. Please, sir. Sorry, who are you? Please. Uh, now you, okay. So I can continue. You can hear me better now. 
So I am here to request $2.5 million uh, in the 2018-2019 fiscal year budget. Um, the Hell Access program has been an opportunity for HANA to educate and spread the key the health information among the, among the community who are directly affected by the appropriate distribution of resources. And I would like to say that because you know that health is a human right for immigrants and also native uh, American citizens in the United States. But the system is very complicated even for for uh, or locals, even worse for um, for immigrants. So pretty much with the existing budget, we were able to provide more than 60 uh, literacy workshops in the year, which is two days uh, outreach in which in each day we were able to outreach 50 people on each activity. And also we were able to provide different workshops in which we explain about affordable healthcare options, immigrant healthcare rights, instructions on complementing emergency uh, Medicaid application, local social services, access to primary and especially care, Medicare uh, Health uh, Care Act, and how immigrants can get access to different health services. Uh, by providing an extra funding or increasing the funding, we were able to meet uh, different demands from the community resident in the Queens. Unfortunately, as you know, immigrant services are often underserved. Um, immigrants communities do not have access to the financial flexibilities to obtain healthcare services. Uh, on my testimony, I brought you a brochure with a, a summary of the campaigns, how we were able to use the funding and how we are helping our community. Thank you for your time. I don't know if you have any questions. Eh, gracias, Enrique. Agradecemos mucho su, oh, su labor y que esté aquí. Uh -huh. Lamentablemente estamos cortos de tiempo, pero... Yeah, I understand, yeah. No, no it's fine. Yeah. Thank I, you I so much your for your testimony. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Micah Bookman. I'm a health educator at Harlem Children's Zone, Promise Academy One. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here as a representative of my community to ask for better access to healthy food in our community. So in my work as a health educator, I've spoken with hundreds of students and parents, all with the same issue, that they want to eat healthier, they want to live healthier lives, but they don't have access to the resources they need to make this a reality. The desire exists, and we're calling on you, the City Council, to help um, meet that demand. As part of the solution to the diet and health issues that we spoke about earlier, uh, we support funding uh, programs that expand access to healthy food, especially uh, SNAP and Health Bucks. These programs have a tangible, real uh, positive impact on our community. You heard the testimony on the broad and complex issues surrounding food access but I would like to zoom in a little bit for you. In my community wellness groups, mothers tell of having to travel an extra 30 minutes out of their way to find a grocery store with sugar-free snacks. Lack of ex access results in parents who find farmers markets overflowing with fresh vegetables near their work by Union Square, but not by their homes in central Harlem. They can forget about finding the minimally processed non-GMO and organic items we know that will improve their diet. When my high school students go to buy snacks at the corner store after school, they can get 42 grams of processed sugar for $2, but a smoothie with fresh fruit costs six. My first grade students are so inundated with unhealthy options, they can instantly recognize french fries and a hamburger, but can't recognize zucchini and Brussels sprouts. In these people, in my community, there is a hunger for fresh and nutritious options. There is a hunger for a healthy future without the pains of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. There is a hunger for quality produce, for meat that is humanely raised, free of hormones, and snacks that are not processed. By funding Health Bucks and SNAP, as, long, as well as the other issues that Robin mentioned, we'll be able to bring those healthy options to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. And I couldn't agree more about the importance of this challenge. Um, and we simply have 
profoundly unequal distribution of healthy food options, especially affordable healthy food, food options, and that problem is arguably getting worse as supermarkets close all over the city. Um, but particularly devastating in low-income areas where there weren't enough supermarkets, certainly not enough healthy supermarkets to begin with. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Paulette Spencer, and thank you very much for holding this session today. Um, I am a community engagement and policy analyst for the Bronx Community Health Network, which is a federally funded health center and nonprofit community-based organization that assures access to quality, um, affordable primary preventive Medicare, uh, medical care and support for social services to residents regardless of their ability to pay or immigration status. My work focuses on BCHN CDC funded Bronx Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health CHAMPS program. REACH's goal is to reduce obesity in communities like the Northeast Bronx where obesity rates are disproportionately high through initiatives supporting healthy nutrition and increased physical activity. Over the past three years, our Bronx REACH CHAMPS 34 member coalition of individuals, local community groups, and Parks Friends organizations and agencies including the New York City Parks Department and policymakers, all committed to making our parks safe, welcoming, and accessible for community use through walking, running, and other fitness activities in seven central and northeast Bronx parks. To date, our REACH Champs Coalition's community-led parks-based activities have become available to more than 300,000 community residents in the um, neighborhoods surrounding our parks. Our coalition partner, New Yorkers for Parks, created a set of seven visitor park guides in English and Spanish that have been widely distributed to community residents and received high praise from the CDC. Uh, in addition to the park guides, through our coalition's park-based activities, we have increased community demand for park-based programs and services. Um, and with our uh, local community uh, volunteers, uh, we have created a tool um, to measure park usage. Um, with in, it enhanced park programming and increased access to parks, our coalition can eventually measure the long-term change in the health statistics in the surrounding communities and examine the extent to which park usage and improved access to parks are related to improving a community's health. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, you know, as a former parks chair, I, I couldn't agree more, and we appreciate you bringing up that important connection. Thank you. All right, thank you, panel. We're going to move on to the next group, which is Anna Krill, from Sharing and Caring, Laura Redman from New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, Yanka Marticek from Emmy Action, Emmy, which I now know does not stand for medical examiner. Melissa Tiarks from self, uh, also uh, a patient activist with, uh, I believe, the ME Coalition. And Joel Ernst. And we are one chair short, so we'll just ask you to swap out as people finish speaking. And would you like to start us off? Good afternoon. My name is Anna Krill. I am founder and president of Astoria Queens Sharing and Caring. On behalf of the board, the staff, and the individuals we help annually, I would like to thank the council for its past support of Sharing and Caring. This year, we're seeking $250,000 in council fundings, an increase of $100,000 from our FY18 award under the Cancer Services Initiative. This funding will allow us to expand our Be a Friend to Your Mother high school outreach program and our partnership with the Queens Public Library. Under our high school outreach program, we educate our young men and women about becoming more proactive in their well-being and health care, and about also the risks that could be minimized of getting breast, testicular, or other cancers. 
We ask them also to bring this message home to their parents and to encourage their parents to go for screening where it is appropriate. Under our initiative, we have reached this past year about 2,000 young men and women and indirectly have affected 4,000 lives through this initiative. Our partnership with the Queens Public Library has enabled us to provide health, mental health, and cancer information to adults in an environment that is a part of the library's ESOL community health programs. Since July 17, we have served over 250 adults through 13 programs at six libraries throughout Queens. Council funding has allowed sharing and caring the, to assist those coping with cancer with an emphasis on the medically underserved, uninsured, linguistically isolated populations throughout Queens County. As a 25-year breast cancer survivor myself, I want to thank you very, very much for all your support in the past and urge you to please fund us again this year and to help us expand our life-saving programs. Well, thank you, Anna, for that great statement and uh, for all the work that Sharing and Caring is doing, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, I am so pleased to meet you, all of you. Uh, my name is Janka Matyczek, and um, I would like to, I came here to raise awareness for illness of MECFS. It's myeli myelagic encephalitis uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I want to talk about it because I have ME and uh, uh, it took four years for me to get diagnosed. Um, I was bedridden for four years and uh, I just wanted to come and show you that I had to go to so many doctors and I have all this, you know, it's not bills, I have insurance, but I didn't, I don't think I had to go through all this to get diagnosed. Um, I, would, I would really want to see funding and uh, for research uh, about this illness. Uh, all the doctors I had to see was, uh, they couldn't diagnose me until uh, in November 2017, I finally got diagnosed after a private lab, lab did uh, uh, blood work on me uh, that cost $10,000. And it's just so much money and a lot of people need help. And um, I, I'm here because I, I want people to know that people go through, uh, this is real illness, like this is not something that it's made up, you know. Um, um, it's so, it's, I'm sorry to talk about it, but it's, it's very touching to me because it's me, it, you know. I, I couldn't walk and I had to start to learn again. I couldn't speak. I, uh, it's de debilitating illness and in, it, it, it should get funding, you know. Um, thank you. Thank you, Yanka, for, for your bravery and battling this condition and, and, and coming and speaking out today so powerfully. Um, I know that one of, one of the frustrating aspects of the condition is it is hard to get diagnosed and perhaps hard to be taken seriously uh, because there's no outward signs of, of of illness uh, at first, um, but we're glad that, that you have persevered and that you appear to be doing better, and uh, I look forward to meeting with the group uh, soon, and hopefully you can be part of that, and, and we can work together to get more attention and resources. Thank you. You got Appreciate it. it. All right. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Laura Redman, and I'm the director of the Health Justice Program at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Um, thank you, Chairperson Levine, for having us here today. Um, the Health Justice Program at NLP provides a kind of racial justice and immigrant focus to healthcare advocacy in New York City and New York State. And I'm here mostly today to talk about the City Council's Immigrant Health Initiative. We are very honored and thank you that NILPI and our uh, community health center partners received 500,000 in funding through the initiative last year. Um, this support has allowed us to expand our work educating immigrant New Yorkers with serious health conditions, their health care providers, legal services providers about health care access and connecting individuals to state funded Medicaid. 
Through this funding, we've been able to train and give informational presentations on immigrant access to health care to hundreds of community-based organizations, health care providers, and legal services providers. We also provide comprehensive screenings and legal representation to individuals, particularly those in health emergencies, and including holistic support for their intersecting needs. In light of the newly understood risks and our focus on health emergencies, our individual cases have become more complex. We've developed a nuanced practice and we take the cases that no one can. I'd like to tell you a few stories. For example, our client Ms. O, a Ghanaian national and Bronx resident with end-stage renal disease, had received treatment from Broadway Dialysis in Elmers for many years. She had no hope for any additional care until she met Nilpi through her doctors. We filed her first immigration application two years ago, enrolled her in Medicaid, and got her on a transplant list. After many hurdles and more legal advocacy from Nilpi, she now has a new hit kidney and life-changing outlook. Another client, Ms. P, is an undocumented mother of two in Elmhurst who has ALS and had lost most of her ability to speak. We gathered a multidisciplinary team at Nilpi and completed a comprehensive immigration, health, and services evaluation. We filed a humanitarian deferred action immigration application on behalf of Ms. P, which was nearly eight inches thick. We worked with the social worker and eventually connected her to full comprehensive state Medicaid. Um, I'll be very quick, but also want to talk to you about the other half of the work that we do under the Immigrant Health Initiative, which is about seeking to improve access to health care in immigration detention facilities. Um, for New York res City residents held in detention, NILPI provides individual and systemic advocacy to improve health care. We do outreach across the city with medical providers, legal services providers, and community-based organizations, and we have built a volunteer network of medical professionals to perform evaluations. Um, we also provide support to the city council-funded New York Immigrant Family Unity Project attorneys. One more example, after nearly 18 months in immigration detention, our client, Mr. S.'s body was racked in pain, covered in sores, and acutely vulnerable to infection. His health had deteriorated de drastically in detention due to poor care. He'd lost over 60 pounds, he couldn't leave his bed or move his fingers. He faced the immediate risk of permanent joint disintegration. His Im immigration attorneys reached to us in crisis, and our team worked through the weekend to activate our volunteer medical network, assess the dangers of his declining health, and made a case for humanitarian release to the Department of Justice. Four days later, he walked out of immigration detention. L Laura, I'm yep. sorry, if you okay. can just summarize, because yep. we have another hearing that needs to start in this okay. room in So like I just say that minutes. we ask for the funding to continue for fiscal year 2019 with an enhancement of $100,000 to deepen our work. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to Nilpi. Um, you do work, uh, incredible work in so many arenas, healthcare being one of them, and, and we will certainly be fighting to renew and expand that initiative. Thanks. Sorry, we're short on time. We have another hearing momentarily in the room. Please. Hi, my name is Melissa Tarks. Um, I'm also an activist with ME okay. Action and have um, ME CFS. You heard from a friend of mine earlier, Terry Wilder, who spoke about Sorry, this. Melissa, just, just one moment. I want to just uh, ask if Alyssa uh, Vassens is still here, she could come and approach. We understand she was going to testify earlier. Sorry, Melissa, you, you can continue. Um, so in my mid-30s, I would have never imagined that I'd be over almost five years into living with a disabling illness that science has yet to understand that it has largely been unstudied by the medical community. It's a disease that strikes the young and healthy, leaving them disabled. An estimated 75% of patients are unable to work, and many are homebound and bedridden. And I myself have been mostly homebound for the past five years of having this illness. This is probably the most prevalent, devastating disease that you and, unfortunately, your doctor has never heard of. Uh, it's called myalgic encephalomyelitis, more commonly referred to as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, very unfortunate um, term for the illness because it does not remotely begin to capture how severely disabling this illness is. MECFS affects up to 2.5 million in the U.S., over 75% of them women. It affects more people than MS and HIV AIDS. It causes profound neurological, immuno immunological, and metabolic dysfunction, resulting in a level of functional impairment that's worse than major medical conditions like congestive heart failure, type 2 diabetes, and multiple, multiple sclerosis. And yet federal funding falls far short 
um, of the funding for diseases with similar disease burden and prevalence. Unfortunately, the extended absence of research funding since the CDC first investigated this illness in the 1980s has resulted in widespread stigmatization and misinformation regarding ME-CFS, resulting in most people with ME-CFS not even having access to a doctor with basic knowledge of this illness. Um, I myself was lucky in that it only took me a year and a half to get, Ill to get diagnosed, and I actually do have excellent insurance and have managed to um, continue working throughout these past few years um, from home, but most people are not that fortunate. The CDC awarded, three, for, awarded funding for three centers of excellence in the U.S. to focus on this disease, two of which are located in New York State at Columbia and Cornell, and yet if you go to Columbia and Cornell, if you go to, for example, the neurology department, you will be hard pressed to find any clinician who knows anything about treating this illness, um, and most likely if they have heard of it, will uh, suggest treatments that result in direct harm to patients. So we really encourage um, the committee to help us educate uh, medical professionals from a clinic, clinical perspective because it is so desperately needed um, in a city where there are actually a few specialists here and centers like Columbia, Cornell, and Sloan Kettering who are doing research on this and yet you can't find a, a clinician at those centers who can treat Th you. Thank you so much, Melissa, uh, for your bravery as well in speaking out. And um, we wish you much success in battling this disease. And uh, I look forward to working with you and the ME Coalition on this issue. Thank you so much for speaking out today. Uh, Joel? Thank you, Chairman Levine and members of the Health Committee on Health for hearing my testimony today. My name is Joel Ernst, and I'm here representing a community of scientists that are working to eliminate tuberculosis. I'm a professor at the NYU School of Medicine, and I've spent the past 25 years working to inform development of TB vaccines. With funding support from the National Institutes of Health and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we've made dramatic progress, but we do not yet have a vaccine that we know works well enough to eliminate TB. I'm here to appeal for your support for increased resources to combat the growing public health threat of tuberculosis as we scientists work to develop vaccines and other improved measures to, improve, uh, to eliminate TB worldwide. The World Health Organization coined the phrase, TB anywhere is TB everywhere, because it is easily spread through the air. TB is on the rise again in New York City as it's multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which is even costlier and more difficult to treat. If we don't prevent and treat TB properly, it will continue to spread, taking many more lives and costing much more to control. New York City provides its, best, its own best lesson for the importance of adequate funding for TB control. The TB control budget was reduced in the 1970s, and by the 1980s, a combination of factors resulted in near tripling of TB cases in New York City, from 1984 to, to 1992. Rebuilding the TB control program in New York City came at a cost of over a billion dollars. However, funding has now been reduced again, and New York City has now seen a 10% increase in the number of TB cases. Are we seeing a repeat of what happened between 1984 and 1985, or will we have the resources to prevent an increase in TB cases this year, the next year, and the next year after that? In addition to my work as a TB researcher, I'm a clinician who has witnessed the devastation TB can cause. I have had a TB patient die on a street corner of pulmonary hemorrhage. I have had several patients paralyzed by spinal involvement by TB, and I've had multiple patients whose brain involvement with TB was irreversible despite our best treatments. Despite my optimism that we will develop TB vaccines, we're not there yet. Now is the time to invest more in the tools we already have for TB control to save orders of magnitude, more work and resources, and avoid further suffering from TB. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for speaking out. It would be a tragedy if we repeated this mistake of the 1970s. Uh, we need to act assertively now to head this off, um, and we're definitely gonna be fighting uh, for more money in the, in the city budget and for restoration of cuts at, at the state level as well. So thank you for speaking out about this.
please. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Danielle Christensen, and I'm here on behalf of God's Love We Deliver. God's Love We Deliver is New York City's leading not-for-profit provider of medically tailored home-delivered meals and nutrition counseling for people living with life-threatening illnesses. God's Love provides services to the most underserved and isolated populations in our city, those who are sick and unable to shop or cook for themselves. We, we believe that being sick and hungry is a crisis that demands an urgent response, and for New Yorkers living with complex illnesses, God's Love is the only service that stands between them and hunger. Each year, God's Love continues to grow um, to meet the demand. Last year alone, we delivered over 1.7 million meals to 7,000 men, women, and children living with severe illnesses throughout the New York City metropolitan area. God's Love is unique due to our focus on nutrition. Um, we have seven registered dietitian nutritionists on staff who tailor each meal to meet a client's specific medical needs. Our services ensure that those living with life-altering illnesses have access to food while also improving health outcomes and reducing health care costs. Research shows medically tailored meals are a low-cost, high-impact health intervention. A recent pilot study showed a 28% drop in average monthly health care costs for patients battling life-threatening illnesses who received medically tailored meals. Also, a 50% fewer hospital admissions, and, 20, and those who received medically tailored meals had a 23% more likely to be discharged to their homes rather than another facility. God's Love is an integral part of the city's safety net that provides a unique service not currently offered by other providers. God's Love serves people of all ages. For example, if you're under the age of 65 living with cancer and are unable to shop or cook for, <clears throat> for yourself, your only option in New York City is God's Love We Deliver. God's Love is also a vital safety net for seniors. Seniors living with serious illnesses that require very specific diets are unable to be served by home-delivered meal providers currently contracted by DIFTA. As a result, these clients are regularly referred to God's Love from DIFTA-contracted meal providers. Despite this fact, we have no contractual relationship with DIFTA. To ensure we can continue to provide services which improve the health outcomes of the increasing number of New Yorkers in need of our services, we ask the council to join us in calling on the administration to include funding for medically tailored home delivered meals in the FY19 budget. Thank you. Thank you. And so how much funding are we currently allocating to that? You say you're asking for an increase. Um, so currently it's a, uh, we're at $90,000 for the speaker request. Um, we have no contractual relationships, so this is all discretionary funding. Um, and I believe last year it was about $188,000 out of our um, $17 million budget. Well, I know that you do incredibly important work, and, uh, and, and certainly you need more resources for that, and, and we will support you in, in that effort. Thank you very much. Okay, this concludes our very, very productive hearing. Thank you all so much.